also 7 o'clock, so I'll call this uh, Committee of the Whole meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Warren? Here. Falk? Here. Bowers? Here. Decker? Here. Hammond? Uh, excuse me. Okay. Hannah? Here. Heideman? Here. Koch? Here. Kittleson? Here. Montemayor? Here. Radke? Here. Rindfleisch? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Versi? Here. Wangaman? Here. We have 15 aldermen present. We have Thank a quorum. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <sighs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <sighs> Looking for approval of the previous minutes? So move. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve the previous minutes. Any discussion? All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Motion carries. Um, for informational purposes, I'd invited the mayor up to utilize the empty seat and the empty mic that uh, we wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, so it would save some time for him if there's any questions for the mayor to walk up to the microphone and back. Uh, it was uh, my decision. If there's any objection, please let me know. Uh, it was simply for convenience purposes. Um, first on the agenda is discussion of possible action on proposals from Ed Wachowski regarding Transit Commission. Uh, four documents are attached. RO 25-42, uh, 25-43, 25-77 from Committee of the Whole, and 332 from Schwein County Taxpayers Alliance. Move to file. So. Motions are made to file. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second. Is there any discussion? Alderman Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just invite, uh, if, if, we, if the uh, committee thought it was appropriate, invite Mr. Wachowski to come up and uh, remind us about what uh, his paperwork was about and what actions he'd like to see us take tonight on behalf of uh, the organization. That's a motion. I'll second it. Second. Uh, motion made and second to open the floor to Ed Wachowski. Ed? Oh, I'm sorry. All in favor say aye. 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 Got to vote on it first. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there are two items that I submitted to Common Council or to the last Common Council. One was a vote yes and one was a vote no. The vote yes document that I submitted talked about the reorganization of the Transit Commission. I'm asking you to file that document and the reason being you have a lot more important business to discuss tonight than this item here. This can be taken up at a later date. So, uh, and I don't want to take the time, your important time, to discuss that document now. But I would like to discuss the second document and start off by saying thank you very much for taking your valuable time this evening to hear my concerns and to hopefully take the appropriate action to remedy these concerns. I was under the, uh, for those of you who are not, who were not in office when I first appeared before the Common Council in February of this year, I will give you a brief overview of the material I supplied at that time. I thought you had received a copy of that material. Have you received, the new order persons received a copy of that material? To clarify, the material was originally sent out, uh, I believe in February to the existing members okay. uh, of the committee. So I guess, like Alderman Radke, uh, some of the new, you probably had not received that unless the um, previous alderman left that information. Alderman Versi, same thing. Okay. If you give well, a brief rundown. It may be a little difficult for you to, f for you to follow then what I'm going to tell you, and, and hopefully uh, I can be, answer any questions you might have to further educate you on the document that I submitted. And this is the document that I submitted. Let me tell you what is in that document, if I may. The first page of the document deals with ordinance number 55-09-10, asking you to approve a change in the fiscal, fiscal control of the expenditures of the transit and parking utility. The second part of the document is Article 5, which talks about boards, commissions, and committees. Section 2 defines, among other things, the responsibility and fiscal controls that apply to the Transit Commission. Fiscal controls of Section 2 states all 
Transit Commission expenditures shall be audited by the Commission and, if approved by the Commission, shall be paid by the City in a manner provided by ordinance. The next section of the booklet regard parking assessment districts and the responsibility of the Commission to operate these districts on a break-even basis with special assess uh, assessment procedures and authority. The next section deals with the revenue and expenses of the parking assessment districts. The next section is an analyst, an analyzation with highlights of some of the information from the city trial balance of the commission for the year ending <coughs> December 31, 2008. And I hope you're familiar with what a trial balance is. A trial balance in the city is a complete documentation of all the expenses by category of a specific department. Accompanied by several pages of that trial balance to support the analysis in the book. There are three entities in the city with the requirement their board audit and approve expenditures before they are paid by the city finance department. They are the Water Utility, the Mead Library, and the Transit Commission. The Transit Commission is the only entity that will not, will not comply with this requirement. Also in the booklet is the Oath of Office. The Oath of Office that you signed and that each elected person, elected official, and appointed official sign as their oath to uphold the laws and regulations of the city and the state. I've also included an excerpt from the Code of Ethics that allows you to understand what actions you may take if you find a violation of the oath of office. I have a letter in here that is from the finance director talking about the uh, approval of the bills from the, from the transit authority. And since you may, may or not, I'm sorry. Just have one quick question. And uh, now you're saying that the Water Utility Commission and the Library Board audit all the bills. That means they take a sample, they take a sample of the bills out, and they check with all those vendors. That's an audit. No. That's an audit. No, it says you Approve, audit. Approval is different from an audit. Audit is sampling, bills received, checking with the vendors to make sure nobody's fudged the numbers. What the library does regarding the audit, they have the bills that have been submitted to the city finance director. Right. Actually, at the meeting. They have a printout from the finance director, the finance department that states what bills have been submitted to them for payment. The finance chair of the library then reviews the bills, the actual copy of the bill, to indicate that it is a legitimate expense with a legitimate notation of the reason for that expense and that it agrees with the printout of, of bills that are asked to be paid. I would argue from my accounting background, that's a review and approval process, that's not an audit. I'm sorry? That's a review and approval process, that is not an audit. Well, we can, we can talk semantics, okay? Yeah. But in my opinion, that, that is... I mean, unless, audit, you're, unless you're testing data. No. Alderman Manhattan, I respect your opinion, as I've respected your opinion many times in the past. Yeah. Not having the Webster Dictionary here, I cannot state what the Webster Dictionary definition of an audit is. I can only rate my feeling as well as you stating your feelings. Alderman Hanna, so to, what you're saying to, that is then... Um, they're, they're, they're approving a compilation, right. perfectly legitimate by a board. So they're not auditing the compilation. Within the, the current audit system, it would put us within compliance with... You got it. ...the statutes. You is what you're talking about. Okay. To Ron McDonald, Director of Transit, copy to Mayor Ryan from Terry Hansen, Finance Director. Changes in the procedure of expenditures. The finance department will be changing the way it proceeds, the, it processes the expenditure of the Sheboygan Transit. 
for Article 5, Section 2-563. All transit commission expenditures shall be audited by the commission, and if approved by the commission, shall be paid by the city in a manner provided by ordinance. This means that all expenditures must be approved by the commission prior to the finance department releasing funds for such expenditures. It will be vital that a list of expenditures it will be vital that a list of expenditures be available to the commission for approval at their scheduled meetings for approval to ensure the timely payment of invoices. This letter uh, was sent and after it was sent to the commission, they then came forth to change the ordinance so that it would not be necessary for the commission to see the bills. The oath of office that each person elected official takes or signs in the Code of Ethics, I did say that, a letter for the finance director. I feel at this point, since you don't have a copy of this booklet, I would like to read the final statement in the booklet, <coughs> it's 33. Just a quick oh, We make the following statement to the common council which oh, speaks Mr. for Kowski, itself. Mr. one moment, please. Okay. We have a comment from the whole. Just sure. a quick question. Um, so, According to former director Hansen, and I think you're probably right, he was using the word audit, but based on your description, follow-on sentences, it sounded like he meant approval. Um, so it was the opinion of the previous finance director that they needed to follow a process they, were not, they are not following. Is that correct? Is yes. that what we should take away from that document? Whether we use the word audit or we let the, the subordinate clause later on that uses the word approval, whichever one of those we, uh, we go with. It sounds like our former finance director, who I think has great respect from the men and women on this floor, said that we weren't following a system as prescribed and we either need to change the system or start complying with it. Is that basically how you yes. would? Okay. And it should also be noted that even after the letter was sent, that the procedure for paying the bills was not altered. Okay, approval was not made by the commission on the bills and the finance department still paid those unapproved bills. And to my knowledge, I still are paying those bills today, unapproved. Based on the reading of the attachment, the conclusion would seem obvious that the transit, that the transit authority, transit commission, and maybe the finance department, along with the city Sheboygan government, not only acknowledges the fact of not following city and state statutes as required by law, but further are doing this act of defiance of law, seeking to change the law to make their actions a presently performed legally. This is contrary to the original intent of the law and finds no exceptions successfully challenged to date in the state. Further, it defeats the purpose, <coughs> the, the proven concept by which we operate in democracy by eliminating the very system of checks and balances conceived to protect the public interest from misuse and waste of public monies. It should also be noted that the lack of constraint or at least yearly update records is lacking, which leaves the door open for further errors not consistent with good business practices. Additionally, the lack of accounting in the area of transit parking accountability is almost non-existent. This particular department of the city of Sheboygan cries for a complete investigation, investigative audience to determine the accuracy of all monies acquired and their sub subsequent dispersal according to law and good government accounting practices. Finally, the complete structure of this department, its administrative management, and controlling membership is in high question of competence capable to actually run this department and may need state intervention to bring this entire situation to even the most basic responsible requirement by law and the public interest. Each year, you are asked, the Common Council, to approve the assessments for the parking districts because they are to run on a um, free of any losses. You don't know how much money is being billed to any business in the district or why there is even a need for an assessment. I would think that your conclusion might be that this has been reviewed by the Transit Commission and there is justification and that the parking authority is being run in a very professional, efficient, and cost-saving manner. 
which I can state from the records that I've reviewed that is not so. The Transit Commission is willfully violating the city ordinance. The Finance Department is violating the city ordinance by paying unapproved bills. And I ask you, is the oath of office and the city ordinances mere words on a piece of paper or do they really mean something and do you hold people accountable to abide by them? Mayor, at a recent Common Council meeting, stated that he has no problem with the commission violating their oath of oath or the city ordinance, two items he has sworn to uphold. Um, I asked, Mr. Wachowski, may I ask you, when, what did I, what, can you quote me, what did I say? I'm sorry? What did I say? These are, this is paraphrased, it's not your exact words. What? Okay. No, may I? Can you repeat had, that, please? You had said that you had no problem with the commission not, not reviewing the bills because there is an audit at the end of the year. Is that but what you that said? Saying, it, what, essence, what did you say the first time? But in essence, what that is saying is that you have no problem with the commission violating their oath of office. I said I have no, no, no problem with the commission violating their oath of office. That's right. That, that, that's those words came out of my mouth? That's my interpretation. I think it's a very loose interpretation, Mr. Wachowski. Um, I if I, if I, I can ask, were you the former uh, chairman of the Transit Commission? Excuse me? Were you the former chairman of the Transit Commission? Uh, yes, several years ago. When you were the former chairman of the Transit Commission, were bills paid in a different manner than they're paid right now? That question was asked for me, of me before, and I repeat that answer, but I will add to that answer, because that question was asked of me by Alderman Hanna. The answer was no, because I did not know that So you were the chairman of the Transit Commission, me, and you didn't excuse know. Excuse me, do you want me to answer the question? If you don't want me to answer Please. the question, then I'll stop there. The answer is no, because I did not know that they had to be approved. However, and that's what I said at the last meeting, and what I'm going to add to that is that the director of the transit sat to my right and never informed me that those bills had to be approved by the commission. Had I known, yes, they would have been approved and they would have been submitted. I did not know. Uh, Alderman Hanna? Yeah, just a, sure. two questions. Um, to the best of your knowledge, uh, have discrepancies come up in the transit audit by Shank or the Federal Transportation Commission? I'm sorry, I have a hearing problem, so I, I have to ask you to repeat. Okay. And to the best of your knowledge, um, have discrepancies or concerns been voiced by Shank or the Federal Transportation Commission on our transit department? I, I really don't know. To my knowledge? Okay. I don't know. I ask you not to approve any change in the fiscal controls of the Transit Commission to enforce the ordinance that is presently in place and to hold the Transit Commission commissioners and the Transit Management accountable for, accountable for their willful violation. The ball is in your court and we the citizens of the city are awaiting your action. And I do apologize if I appear to be argumentative with the mayor or argumentative with Alderman Hanna. I've tried not to enter any type of emotion to this type of presentation, but it is highly emotional to me. And highly emotional to me because the people who work the buses, the drivers, are outstanding people. They do a job, they are probably the best employees of this city, okay? And I don't want to hurt them, but I think something has to be done and it's up to you to do it. You can, you can file this if you so desire, but then you're saying that the oath of office means nothing. The ordinance of the cities can be followed or not followed by any citizen, or you're saying from the quote from the Animal Farm book that all people are created equal, but some people are created more equal than others. Thank you very much for listening to me. Alderman Moore. Uh, Mr. Wachowski, I got a question for you. And, and there's a question for you. Speak up. I apologize. I'm suffering from the cold. My head is all stopped up, and I have a problem hearing. 
uh, before we act on your second document, you said the first document uh, you didn't want to really discuss tonight. Uh, would a better motion on your first document to be ho to hold that rather than file it and then maybe schedule it again? Well, I, I would ask that that either you file it or you hold it. If you hold it, that would be my first preference. Okay. Uh, but I didn't want didn't want to enter into discussion on it this evening to take valuable time away from other items that because you, you have a very busy schedule. Right. I would appreciate it if you did hold it. Well, we have a motion on the floor to file this. I'd make a motion to hold. Uh, I would second that on document number 2542. Yeah. 2542. Okay, motion made and second to hold document 2542. Um, any discussion on that item? Any discussion on that item? All in favor of that motion to hold, say aye. Um, all in vote. So I just want to. Because I don't have them in front of me. Okay, 2542 is the document to uh, reorganize the structure of the committee. Nothing not to do with nothing to do with what. We're, okay. No, thank no, you. A separate issue. It's still along the transit commission, but not that way. Uh, all in favor of holding document 2542, all, say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed. Motion. I'm sorry. Uh, one opposed. Thank you. All in favor. Motion is made and second to. File the rest of the documents. Um, is there any response from City Attorney uh, McLean or Director uh, McDonald, if you'd like to respond? Thank you. <coughs> now to take a statement from Paul Harvey, now for the rest of the story. The way the bills are paid in the Transit Commission is the way it's been paid, I believe, since the inception or very shortly thereafter of Sheboygan Transit. Uh, the current chairman of the Transit Commission did some research, went back to the inception of Transit and found the documentation as to when that was set up. There was a discussion or a, a memo from uh, Finance Director Hansen uh, because of a request from Mr. Wachowski. Um, I talked to Terry. Um, he had a discussion with Attorney McLean. Uh, we talked about how the bills were paid, and it was uh, based on that discussion that Attorney McLean drafted a new ordinance and said this makes sense the way the Transit Commission is doing it. Uh, the general ordinance was sent to the council, it was approved by the Transit Commission, sent to the council, and then it was held in the previous council onto this uh, committee of the whole meeting. Um, regard to discrepancies or, or alleged improprieties, uh, I'll guarantee you we get audited more than any other department in the city. As a matter of fact, our audited numbers get audited by the State Department of Transportation. Um, and the mayor can attest to that because he just had one come through a couple of days ago into his office. Um, to answer Alderman Hanna's yeah. comment or question, uh, we have never had any findings in any audit that we've ever had done, whether it be from Schenck or the state DOT or the Federal Transit Administration. As a matter of fact, the last audit of the Federal Transit Administration, we received an award because we had zero findings out of the 23 areas of compliance that we were reviewed in. It's such an extraordinary feat. They sent us a certificate because we were, uh, it was so well done. So I would like to dismiss the, the claims and accusations that have been thrown around and spewed around this, this community for the last several months. Um, let me tell you how the process actually works. We typically need an item. I'll use a bus part as an example. We'll talk to the purchasing agent, Bernie Romer. He will put out bids, or in some cases, uh, our deputy director will put out bids for bus parts if it's a specific vendor. Uh, we then submit a requisition for those parts into the city purchasing department. The parts are ordered through the purchasing department. Uh, if they exceed $15,000, they come to the council for approval and go through the finance committee like the rest of the city does. Um, when the parts come in, uh, the staff signs off that we've in fact received the parts that we've ordered. 
Uh, they then get submitted into the MUNIS system for an invoice payment, uh, the, or the invoices get submitted for payment. They come to me, I sign off on them. They go then to the finance director. The finance director reviews them. They then get paid. Uh, the transit commission chairman then gets a check register of every check written on behalf of the transit commission uh, for any parts or any items regardless. Uh, Sheboygan Transit doesn't issue a check. It all comes out of the finance department. Uh, those record journal, uh, check journals are given to the Transit Commission chairman for review and questioning. Uh, the, the commission has talked about it, whether or not they, the, as a uh, commission, want to review all of the uh, entries, and they've, in fact, agreed on numerous occasions they wanted to keep the process the same as it was. Um, I look back uh, to notes uh, dating back to 2008 when Mr. Wachowski uh, raised this issue and uh, it was actually, I'm going to find the, the minutes here. Bear with me a second. In 2008, uh, then Mayor Juan Perez uh, made a statement that he'd like to make it very clear that there's been no improprieties uh, by the commission or the transit staff and that any implications of such are inappropriate. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Perez went on to thank me for the job that I'm doing. Uh, Alderman James Gisha motioned to authorize to continue the procedures as they've always been performed and Mayor Perez seconded that motion. That was in 2008. Uh, Mr. Wachowski wasn't happy with it and, and talked Terry Hansen into uh, uh, reviewing it. Terry did and after he sent out that initial memo that was cited to you uh, without telling you the rest of the information that when I received the memo Terry and I had a discussion along with a discussion from Attorney McLean and ultimately it was decided that the ordinance should be changed to actually uh, mirror the practice that's been going on since the inception of the Sheboygan Transit Commission. Um, the, there hasn't been any type of uh, effort to conceal things. Uh, anybody who wants to look at them, it's an open record. I mean, my gosh. Um, uh, Dr. McDonald, we have a question. Yeah. Um, Ron, uh, I know that there was a document in council at one time for changing that ordinance on how those bills were paid. Correct. I, I don't recall myself. Did that pass? No, it was actually held and it's, it's here tonight. It was held, it was held in, in, and it's here tonight. Right. Um, you know, in my, in my opinion, and, and I will uh, uh, agree with my predecessor, Mayor Juan Perez, that uh, Director Ron McDonald is an outstanding director of his department. Um, this is not something that he came up with since he walked into transit. This is something that has been done since its inception in the 1960s? 70s. 70s. Um, so it's not like uh, the rules have been changed midway through the game. The purpose of changing the ordinance is to comply with practices that have been going on for decades in the city. This department is audited in more than any other department. As Ron said, um, when the federal government audited him, they gave him an award, which I believe he has hanging on his wall. Absolutely. Um, so to change the rules, um, to not pass the ordinance to meet the practice that has been going on for the last 30 years is ridiculous in my opinion. It would be different if we had discrepancies in our audits. His department gets audited two, three times every year. Frequently. Frequently. And there's never been a discrepancy in the audit. So in my opinion, this is a non-issue and this ordinance should be, should be passed and the, uh, the ordinance should read, should comply with, with the practices that we are, that we are presently. Uh, to, clar to clarify the, um the ordinance actually is not um, on today's agenda. Uh, it was not in the uh, Committee of the Whole inbox, oh, okay. I guess. So uh, I, that ordinance will have to be resubmitted. But it, it, was, it was held. It was held, right. Discussion. It is actually included in, as one of the attachments on the agenda. 2577. Uh, one of them had multiple documents. Um, I believe it was RO 10910 I believe if you look at that, it has multiple documents on it. It's in here. It is in? It's in the original document that we got from Mr. Wachowski. Wachowski. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it was council document number 2150. That was the ordinance. Attorney McLean, 
it would be appropriate for the council to make a recommendation on the ordinance itself, um, considering the agenda does not specifically clarify that ordinance is part of it. Uh, I guess I would say if it's part of the RO that's referenced in the agenda, okay. uh, I don't see a problem with this committee making a recommendation to council uh, with respect to uh, that document. I know uh, I generated the document after talking to uh, Terry Hansen and uh, uh, Ron McDonald. Uh, this was months ago and it was referred to committee of the whole and sat there and uh, no action was taken. Uh, I think the sooner you know, in my view, uh, you know, if the, if the ordinance doesn't follow what we're doing uh, and the finance director is satisfied that what we're doing is fine, the, the ordinance reflects what we're doing, uh, it makes sense to me to, uh, to enact that. But that's certainly up to the council. Uh, you guys can uh, uh, decide how you want the checks and balances, but the, it's my understanding that this is more of a historical issue that uh, has crept up over time. And uh, when uh, it was brought to my attention, my suggestion was to, uh, uh, as long as there's no auditing issues or uh, finance department issues, to uh, update the ordinance to reflect what we're actually doing. That seems to make sense to me. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Uh, Alderman Watson, you already made the original motion uh, um, to file. I I will we'll withdraw that file. Um, well, we could probably make a motion to file the communication, uh, but recommend to the council to pass the, oh. the attached ordinance, if that's... Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay, would the second agree to that? Second. Okay. Sure. So, uh, modifying the original motion uh, from filing to file the communication and recommend, recommend to the full council to pass the ordinance, general ordinance. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Montemayor, you are next on the button. You're, nothing oh, else no, to add? That's okay. it. Thank you. Alderman Bourne? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we would vote on this, uh, for, the, for the new older persons or the older persons that don't have, them with, have this with them, would it be appropriate for you to read before we vote on it? And then another question would be, I guess, for Attorney McLean, is that if we, if we do end up giving a favorable recommendation on this general ordinance, and it goes to the council on the 16th or whenever our next meeting is, then usually ordinances have to lie over for the final. So we actually, if we, we wouldn't approve this actually then until the first part of September. So ordinances generally lie over, right? Right. Okay. Would you like, do you have a copy of this? Would you like to read it to the older persons that don't have it before we vote on it? It's not that lengthy, a few paragraphs. It's document number 2150. Ordinance repealing and re recreating section 2 563 of the municipal code relating to fiscal control of transit commission expenditures so as to conform with current practice. The Common Council of the City of Sheboygan do ordain as follows Section 1. Section 2 563 of the Sheboygan Municipal Code entitled Fiscal Control is hereby repealed and recreated to read as follows Section 2 563, Fiscal Control. Unless otherwise authorized by the Transit Commission, all books of accounts shall be kept in the office of the city finance director slash treasurer. All transit commission expenditures shall be approved by the transit director and shall be paid by the city in the manner provided by ordinance. A payment register shall be reviewed by the transit commission or its designee. Section two, all ordinances or parts thereof in con conflict with the provisions of this ordinance are hereby repealed to the extent of such conflicts and this ordinance shall be in effect from and after its passage and publication. Thank you. Um, I have two lights on Alderman Bauck and Bowers. I'm not sure actually who is first, so. Um, <laughs> Alderman Bowers, go ahead. Okay, I guess the question I have, are we talking just procedural changes here? Are we talking a big change in accounting procedures? Or uh, are we just changing an ordinance? Or uh, is this going to entail 
uh, redoing our books. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused at this point. This ordinance will change nothing from the way it's being done right now. It's, it's absolutely the same as the way it's being done. So the only thing that I get out of this, it comes through the finance director instead of you? No, actually, uh, the well, they come to me for approval, but from there they go to the finance director for review before they get paid. Um, this is merely uh, changing the ordinance so it, it mirrors what the practice has actually been for the last 30 plus years. I guess to clarify also, anything that comes out of Transit Commission is not paid directly by them. It goes through the, fi go the finance department. And that would be the current system uh, as is, which would be uh, put in line with the general ordinance that's as pr presented right now. Alvin Bauck. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just out of my respect for Citizen Wachowski and for Citizen Watchdogs in general, I'd like to give him a chance to come up and, and just answer. Uh, my original concern was that we weren't following a procedure. Now, if we change that ordinance, we'll be following it. And I'd like to just ask Citizen Wachowski, where's the downside to that? What are we missing? Um, if, if we begin following that ordinance, how is that putting the city at risk? You mean if the ordinance is changed? Or? Right. If we, if we change the ordinance so we begin following the laws we put up, where's the downside to that? We do need to be we do need to use the mic because we are being televised. The downsides to that is spelled out in the book because Mr. McDonald has said this is the way we've done it all along and that it works, okay? The mayor has said this is the way they've been doing it for 30 years. Well, I can tell you there were traffic signals on 8th Street for 20 years and now they've been removed because it didn't make any sense. Times changed, things changed. Why? Does it make sense to have a system of checks and balances? It's very simple. When you look at the budget, and in this case, the transit budget that was approved by the Transit Commission, it's not an absolute authority to spend. It's a roadmap to spend. Every other department, if they overspent or underspent, a category within the budget asks for a budget transfer. So their budget is actually balanced and brought in to focus with what their authority, whomever oversees them, has agreed upon. However, if you look at the uh, budget for the year, and it, budget for 2009 was not available when I put this together, okay, so that's why I used 2008. Salaries were $95,089.25 less than budgeted. Health insurance was $43,571 less than budget. The uh, professional organizations, and that, that's positive, that's positive. But then you say, well, if it's less than budget, where did the money go? I mean, does that mean that, that the transit authority then has all this money to spend? The answer is no, because there's no oversight, okay? Oversight Kowski. because the paratransit. Mr. Wachowski, so you're claiming that, uh, I'm there, sorry? you're claiming then that in the 2008 budget, there will be some kind of financial shenanigans, that there's missing money, is that what you're saying? These are from their financial reports, not from mine. Right. Uh, okay. What we're saying, though, is that that budget's been audited, and the federal government, while they probably can play shenanigans with their own money, I'm sure they don't allow other communities to play shenanigans with their money. So if you look at you're the not claiming that there's shenanigans. You're mm -hmm. saying the system does work, or are you saying the system's not working and there's missing money? Because I find that very tough to believe that we will win a ward um, of having you know, no problems, no mistakes, and no lost money, and you're claiming that there is lost money. In the, in the real world, uh, budgets are reviewed by boards of directors of corporations on a monthly basis. If their board of directors meetings are on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, if their meetings are on a quarterly basis, I know that for a fact because I put those figures together for the company that I work for. But if you look at power transit on here, they're $216,000 overspent. 
how do you spend $216,000 over without any oversight? And I appreciate Mr. McDonald coming here and saying all the good things he said, but one thing he hasn't said is that he has been violating the city ordinance. You which, know, which it's like parking your car outside, and it says a new parking sign. You park your car there for years. It doesn't make it right. And then all of a sudden, an officer comes along, gives you a ticket. Is the officer wrong? Or have you gotten away with something for all those years? I'm sorry, but the ordinance is very specific, and the ordinance has been violated. And that system of checks and balances is at the window. Okay, and when budgets are figured, they're figured on actual, to, excuse me, on budget to budget, not actual to budget, or actual to actual. And without any types of controls, you're saying, here's $2.5 million, do with whatever you want to do with it, regardless of the service you're providing. And Mr. McDonald will tell you himself that the service that's being provided by transit today is bad not satisfactory, and I've heard him say that many times, okay? And it's because the money's not being, in my op opinion, properly used. The library got billed 3,900 hours for the assessment district. When you look at how lot 13 and 14 are managed, there's no incentive to put any type of controls on the expenses or to increase the income because nobody's looking at the budget. All you do is you bill everybody in, center, in the center city district additional money, and then you say, why don't people want to be located down here? You know, is there any controls? If you don't want any type of fiscal controls, and it was also stated up here that if there's no problem with the finance department with the way things are, then there shouldn't be any objection. Well, here's a letter that says there is a problem with the way things are being handled. Here's a letter, not mine, I didn't generate the letter. The finance director gener the, generated the letter and said you're violating the system of controls and balances and I expect you to adhere to that. And if you put an ordinance in to change something, whatever it is, that doesn't negate how you do business today. It may negate how you do business or change how you do business tomorrow if it's approved. But I think it's extremely arrogant and that's my word, arrogant, to continue a practice when you know that you're not doing what you're supposed to do and saying that this council will approve what you want them to do so you're going to do it in advance of that approval. And I'm sorry, but I think that is totally, totally, totally inappropriate. And I hope I've answered your question. I'm sorry to go on so long with it, but without the system of, of, of checks and balances, why do you have all these committees? Why do you have the government set up the way it is today? I mean, this violates the basic principles of government, checks and balances of money coming in, approval of the money going out. You say to me, gee, do you think there's any hanky-panky going on? I don't know. I don't review their bills. But I'll tell you this right now, if I were sitting where you're sitting, okay, I would be asking for an audit of the transit by an outside auditor. And you want to know something? You can't do that because you have no control over what transit does. However, and there is always a however, you can tie the funding of transit for 2011, asking that they submit a budget and a request for funding in 2011 which includes an audit of the books for 2009. And then you decide whether or not checks and balances work. You decide whether or not the system today works. And you decide whether or not tax dollars and whether they come from this city, from this county, from this state, or from the federal government are my tax dollars. And my tax dollars and your tax dollars should be accountable, and there should be some system of checks and balances. And if you don't want to do that, God bless you, okay? Because that is, in my opinion, a wrong stance to take. But the decision is yours.
And I don't want to sound like a preacher up here, but my God, that's exactly what I feel like, that I need divine intervention to have a system of checks and balances put in place so that I wouldn't have to be here, so we wouldn't have to be talking about this evening this issue, so we wouldn't have any type of cloud over anyone, okay? Thank you very much. Um, you may Mr. want to speak first. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in response to Mr. Wachowski's checks and balances and the lack thereof, uh, if you do read this, uh, read the ordinance fisc uh, under section 2-563 called fiscal control. Unless otherwise authorized by the Transit Commission, all books of accounts shall be kept in the office of the city finance director treasurer. All Transit Commission expenditures shall be approved by the transit director and shall be paid by the city in the manner provided by ordinance, which is paid by finance. Um, a payment register shall be reviewed by the Transit Commission or its designee, which is the Transit Commissioner. Um, regarding audits, as we've said again and again, we have Shank audit the Transit Commission. Um, Shank is not a division of the city. It's an outside auditing company. We have the state and the federal government also not divisions of the city that do audits of the transit, of the, of, of the transit, of Sheboygan Transit. What more can we ask for? We have outside auditors, we have fiscal control. All we're trying to do is put the ordinance in line with practices over the last X amount of years that there have never been any discrepancies found. And to blow this up into um, a conspiracy I don't think is appropriate at all. So I would ask that the, that the Committee of the Whole send a recommendation to the Council to approve this ordinance. Dr. McDonald, if I could just uh, make one comment and, you know, yes, our 2009 books were audited already by Schenck. I believe all of you received the audit. I know it went through the Finance Committee. My guess is it came back to the Council already and there were no findings. Oh, we didn't get it. Not yet. There are uh, checks and balances um, typically defined by the auditors how we, how we proceed. Um, there's been a lot of different mudsling thrown out there to try and confuse the issue like we're not capturing enough money in lots 13 and 14. Well, quite frankly, there's a contract with the Boston store that says we can only charge X number of dollars. That's a contract that the city entered into that you entered into, not me. Mm -hmm. That dictates what we can do. I'm just following the, what the contract says. I would like to also add that, uh, or reiterate, I've had a conversation with then Finance Director Terry Hansen about the procedures. We had a discussion with Attorney McLean. After that discussion, it was decided that the best route to go would be to change the ordinance. Finance Director Hansen was on board with that. And quite frankly, if he wasn't on board with it, it would be no different than my kid asking me for money to go to the movie, and I said no. He wouldn't pay the bills if he didn't think it was appropriate. He's a director of all the money that comes into this city. That's where they get paid. I don't pay them. Well, all of our stuff goes to the finance department and the finance director was signing off on all of the invoices for payment. So to, to sling mud and in, in, uh, say there's a cloud over this is absolutely ridiculous and, um, you know, whatever. I, I could go on for a long time, but... Uh, Alder Hanna? Yeah, just a quick question. Have we received a copy of the 2009 Shank audit yet? Was those distributed yet? I, I'm not aware of that myself. Yeah, I don't think so yet. It, um, okay. But, but it, to the best of your knowledge, Mayor, when you've met with the representative Shank, did they raise any concerns? Uh, no, trans? there were no discrepancies found in oh, 2009. No. Thank you. Okay. I was there. Alderman Moore? Uh, as, of this <clears throat> as of this afternoon, in a discussion I had with Nancy Buss, acting finance director, the Shank audit is not done because I was hoping it would be done so we would have some information on one of the later agenda items, but she said it's not done and she's trying to get it, but there's been some vacations over there, et cetera, so we don't have it. 
thing. I'm sorry, I misspoke. 2008 was done. 2008 must have been the one that just came through finance a couple of months ago then. I thought it was 2009. Sorry. All right, there are no other lights. There is a motion uh, at this time. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Motion carries. Next on the agenda, discussion of possible action on communication from Alden Boren. Communication 6 39 from Alden Boren. The floor is yours. <laughs> Got to find it here, my. Uh, I would I would make a motion to file I would make a motion to file this and I guess all I want to say is that the uh, the uh, guest editorial that I read uh, that I wrote for the Sheboygan Press a while back uh, created a lot of discussion in the community about the W uh, Wisconsin Retirement Fund and I think the uh, discussion was healthy and I think the discussion is going to uh, continue and hopefully it'll continue right through to the next negotiations we have with our, uh, with our uh, union partners at, uh, here in the city. So uh, that's really all, I, really all I wanna say about it is the reason I wrote it is just to, to start some discussion and make the citizens aware <coughs> of what the situation is with the Wisconsin Retirement Fund is, how it affects our city employees and public employees throughout the state, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Warren. Uh, motion been made to file the document. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second to file the document. Alderman Hanna, under discussion. Just a, just a quick question, and I do want to compliment Alderman Warren. I think thought-provoking letters to the community are important. Um, I think those ongoing discussions are good to have. Um, I think that just makes for good government, and you don't have to agree with anything that I might write. You don't have to agree with everything that Corey Bauck may write or, or what, what Jim writes. Um, but the important thing is we're putting issues out there from a perspective. And I think that's a positive. Very good. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Right. Next on the agenda, discussion and possible action on communications receiving, received regarding Alderman Kittleson. Uh, 9-21 from Dulcie Johnson and 9-25 from Marge Matter. <laughs> you would like to start? Motion to file. Motion made to file. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Motion made and second to file. And discussion? Alderman Hanna? Yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted to, to comment that I've been on the council for five plus Alderman years Hanna, now. Oh, forever. Your Sorry. Mic. I've been on the, uh, the council for almost as long as all the person Kittleson. And to the best of my recollection, um, anything that would benefit the fact that her husband uh, is a retired uh, fire department employee, to the best of my knowledge, she recused herself and abstained in every single issue. Um, I voted to have this moved here because I believe firmly that uh, Arnold Alderman Kittleson, all the person Kittleson should be given the opportunity in a public forum to explain that I've played by the rules. And I believe she has played by the rules. Thank you. Alderman Bauck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too uh, would weigh in on that. I, I'd say that uh, um, Alder person Kittleson uh, has been reelected by her constituents. There's no doubt in their mind that she is. Uh, uh, comes with her perspective. She doesn't benefit by the continuing of a firefighter uh, ambulance system. She abstains from the votes from which she could potentially benefit, but that's her perspective. Whatever her vote is on the, the, the ambulance service is her perspective, and her constituents have reelected her with that perspective. So I would say that that's between her and her constituents. But I also want to applaud the citizenry for writing in with their Absolutely. concerns. We also want to make sure that people who have concerns, and if there's a perception of fairness, what we did with Alderman Versi, and, uh, and if there are some outstanding questions about uh, President Kittleson, those need to be aired, and, uh, and I, I agree with uh, um, uh, Alderman Hanna that this is the right venue for that. So again, I, I applaud the, the citizens for writing in with concerns. I think we're doing the right thing here tonight by talking about that. And again, I, I think uh, President Kittleson's constituents have weighed in on her opinions, and they like her opinions, and they keep sending her here. So um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other discussion? The citizens who, uh, who wrote the communications are available. Uh, they are here today. Um, I make a motion to open the floor to any one of the citizens that want to speak on this. Second. Okay. Um, 
Uh, so the motion made to allow Adult C. Johnson and Marge Matter, who wrote the communications, to speak. Motion made and second. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Lynn Fleisch. <clears throat> There has long been concern in the community about Alderman Kittleson voting on fire department and ambulance related issues. We know that Alderman Kittleson's husband is a retired Sheboygan Fire Department employee retiring in December 2005 after many years on the force. On September 6, 2005, Alderman Kittleson voted for the bids and contract for station number five while her husband was a full-time employee of the Sheboygan Fire Department. In fact, I believe Alderman Kittleson's husband was a deputy chief in the department at that time. For her to vote no would undoubtedly have created an unpleasant working environment for her husband. There was no financial gain to her husband but given his employment with the department, abstention would have been appropriate to avoid the appearance of bias. May 29, 2007, she voted to give the ambulance to the Sheboygan Fire Department. Again, no financial gain, but again, abstention would have been appropriate to avoid the appearance of bias. I could cite other examples related to the ambulance, but you all know what they are. Again, no financial gain, but it would have been better to abstain. <clears throat> On April 7, 2010, she voted against the smoke detector ordinance that was proposed by Chief Herman. At that time, her husband was president of the Lakeshore Apartment Association and one must presume that the Kittlesons are thus in the apartment rental business, so she should have abstained. There were personal financial concerns about this ordinance because of the cost to apartment owners, owners to purchase and install the new smoke detector. <coughs> Actually, Alderman Kittleson moved to amend the ordinance on the council floor after it came from the committee. You will recall that one of the complaints against Alderman Versi was that he made a motion on the council floor regarding the ambulance. Was Alderman Kittleson representing her personal interests and the interests of the organization that her husband led or what was in the best public interest? Her husband, of course, had every right to represent his organization. But as a person who would benefit from the defeat of this organization, ordinance, Alderman Kittleson should have abstained. Is it personal bias or a matter of ethics? Ethics is a principle of right or wrong. I gave an example of Alderman Kittleson's obvious bias with the Greater Sheboygan White Paper and her comment about Chief Herman's response. She has said that she has to do what is in the best interests of the Sheboygan Fire Department which may not necessarily be in the best interests of her constituents. Public interest must be the primary concern of all elected officials. Alderman Kittleson's relationship with the fire department employees via her husband's employment history makes it extremely difficult at best for her to make impartial decisions on behalf of her constituents vis-a-vis -vis the fire department. That alone is reason enough for her as a matter of good conduct and ethical practice to abstain. There need not be direct financial gain for it to be prudent for an elected official to abstain from voting on matters in which they clearly have an established bias. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Madden, would you like to speak? Floor has been open to you. <laughs> Mike, yeah. it's, it's bendable, Marge. How's this? Can you all hear me? Yep. Yep. Good. We can't see you, but we can hear you. This is really different. 
I'm used to sitting back there and looking at the backs of your heads and pretty, checking out who needs haircuts and who doesn't. Pretty scary this way, huh? Yeah. So this is really different. I want to commend anybody who has the, the courage to stand up here and speak before 16 prove-it-to-me people. It's a challenge, but I will accept it. I'm not here to, quote the mayor, drag anybody through the mud or to seek a character assassination. That isn't what I want to do. I want to talk about the power of your vote. Now we have many people here who come to the council and you don't know how they're going to vote. Constituents don't know how they're going to vote. But when that motion comes to the floor, that's when the power comes into play. Whether you're going to vote aye or no, that's going to determine what's going to happen to our city. Now, it's already been mentioned that Alderman Kittleson voted for this majority that did not accept the fire chief's suggestion for an upgrade on smoke alarms. And this is where the abuse of power comes in. And at this point, I would respectfully ask no faces and no eye rolling from anybody up here or the council line or the, or the assembly. I deeply resent that. But I will go on to say that sometime a little while ago, another citizen stood here, a little taller, and she asked if Alderman Versi would uh, abstain from voting on anything concerning the ambulance service. Not one alderman, nor the mayor, defended him. Two, may, uh, two aldermen did admit that they do abstain from issues that might put a cloud on their vote. Former alderman Jim Gisha explained that in order to avoid any doubt, any shadow, any cloud, it is better to abstain from any vote. And this is why I'm asking Alderman Kittleson to abstain from any future votes concerning the fire department or the ambulance. It is true that she abstains from anything concerning the funding for uh, retirement or health care. But there are many other issues, as has already been pointed out, that she has voted aye. Now, if my worthy opponent, the mayor, decides to rebut me, I respectfully ask the president of the council, of the committee of the whole, to have the mayor come down here, face you all just as I am, and I respectfully ask that he does not lose his cool, as he did the other night at the council, because the judges and the voters do not like anybody losing their cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I may, please. It's a point of order. Come on. What? Mr. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, and I respect the mayor, but this is this is the council's this is the council's a committee of the whole. And I, I, I guess I've got, a, com I, I've got a, a concern with the mayor making comments. I think this should be the alderman first, and then at your discretion whether you feel the mayor should be making comments on this, but I have a problem with it. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you, Alderman Boren. I was just trying to fulfill a citizen's request. So. Uh, if I, I may, will, mayor, I, will be, um, I will be seated. And just if I may, um, is that an objection to my ruling? You can do well, that. I don't know if you Well, I don't know if you made a ruling yet. Uh, by allowing it, that's... The movement of the chair is to allow the mayor to speak well, in, in then direct it, response. Then it, then it, I, I guess I don't like it, Alderman Rinfleisch, but you're the chairman, so I'll respect that. Um, but you can object, and then we can go to a vote. Because it is, well, as you say, it is, it is the Alderman's I'll, I'll, I'll make a formal objection then. Okay, well, there's objection. Is there a second to that objection? Second. 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 Motion made and second. Um, the objection uh, of the ruling of the chair to allow the mayor to speak. Uh, is there any, um, well, all in favor of the objection overruling my vote say aye. aye aye opposed aye we'll do a roll call 
Foreign? And I vote would be to overrule? To overrule. To okay, aye. All right, we're voting on whether to allow the mayor to speak. All right, a yes vote doesn't so allow An I vote is to overrule my decision to allow the mayor to speak. So an I would not allow the mayor to speak at this time. All right. All right. Foreign? Aye. Falk? Aye. Bowers? Aye. Decker? No. Hammond? Is excused. Hannah? No. Heideman? Aye. Kath? Aye. Kittle, I'm going to abstain. Montemayor? No. Radke? No. Rindfleisch? No. Vanderweel? No. Bercy? Aye. And Wangaman? Aye. Might as well take your seat, Mayor. Seven yes, six no, and one abstention. Have a nice evening. I hope you make the right decision tonight. Thanks, Mayor. Um, moving on then, uh, the lights is for Alderman Wagman. Uh, you can turn it off. My question was answered. Thank you. Alderman Bauck. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, oh, I was just going to thank the two citizens. Again, that's why this country is great and this process is great is because they've made very uh, thought-provoking comments and have made me uh, reconsider and although she doesn't owe us that perhaps President Kittleson would like to weigh in on how she will uh, make her decision whether to vote in the future she uh, that's between her and her constituents in the interest of transparency if she would choose to talk to us about how her mind works and how she chooses when to vote and what she's committing to in the future that would be a welcome thing because I think they brought up great points with regard to um, interests and and going beyond a shadow of a doubt of, of, of there being no issues Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Alderman um, my recommendation is, um, as Alderman Versi did, is to not respond at this time. Uh, feel free to do so. It was your decision. Um, only because, uh, well, you did respond at the very end, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but um, may I ask um, Attorney? Uh, may I ask Attorney McQueen uh, to come up and, and speak on this topic, please? Could the floor be opened for him? Yes. I would make a motion to open the floor. Second. Second. Motion made and second to open the floor to Attorney McLean. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Attorney McLean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, I, I noticed I read uh, Ms. Johnson's letter and uh, Ms. Mattern's email quite closely, and uh, I don't see any ethics violation being alleged. Uh, in fact, Ms. Mattern says this in no way suggests any breach in ethics. Uh, uh, Dulcie Johnson speaks to a concern about bias and a concern about uh, what other people in the community have said. Uh, I think Alderman Kittleson's record speaks for itself. She's been uh, elected several times. Uh, I think everybody comes to political office with certain biases. Uh, one way or the other. Uh, this is a nonpartisan body, but you look at the state legislatures and the, the federal legislatures, <laughs> Republican and Democrat, independent, uh, they, those uh, individuals follow a, the party line, so to speak. Uh, are they biased? Sure. Is that impermissible? No. Uh, where you get into impermissible biases is in uh, adjudicatory or quasi-judicial type of proceedings where uh, bias is a form of prejudgment. You uh, have a certain uh, preconceived opinion before you hear the facts on a particular adjudicative type of matter. But typically that, that's not the case on a legislative matter. Uh, it's clear uh, Alderman Kittleson's record speaks for itself. She supports the fire department. Uh, she's been reelected a number of times. Her constituents apparently know that and uh, feel that that's fine. That's certainly an appropriate issue when it comes to the ballot box next time she runs for uh, election uh, for any opposing candidate. If they feel that uh, that's not good for the city, then 
let them make that a campaign issue. But I don't view this as an ethics issue. The ethics code, both our local ordinance, the state statute on uh, ethics for local government officials deals with personal interests and financial interests. Uh, you can start going pretty far afield when you start talking in general about bias. But personal interests uh, deals with interests by blood or marriage on particular issues. Uh, financial interests deals with monetary gain. The concept is, uh, are you taking an action for yourself or your, your family's interests, or are you looking out for the welfare of the city? And I must say, in my experience, uh, Alderman Kittleson has come to me, perhaps more than any other alderman, uh, with questions about uh, and concerns about whether she should vote on a particular matter or not. Uh, I've, uh, I've disclosed to her a couple of times that I didn't see any problem with her voting on a particular matter, but yet she's still abstained. So, uh, you know, are there issues go back five, ten years ago that, uh, you know, maybe she could have abstained on, maybe uh, she couldn't have? Uh, maybe. I think that's true with everybody, but uh, uh, I, you know, as, as an ethics issue, I just don't see it in this, this case. Uh, and again, uh, neither of the, uh, the letters really talks about uh, Alderman Kittleson having a personal or financial interest in, uh, in the action she's taken or accuse her of unethical conduct. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Um, Alderman Osmeyer. Thank you. I guess I was going to say a couple of words about our bias, and, and pretty much what um, Attorney McLean said, we all come here with certain biases. In fact, that's usually our platform, and I think we all know what our platform and our biases are here. On the mercy. Thank you. This is actually from Attorney McLean. Um, Ms. Johnson brought up a, a fact that was outside the fire department of April 2007, of this year. And the RFC number was the vote, the 4970910 about the vote, about the smoke alarm ordinance, when she had, she voted no against the ordinance. That's um, not fire detectors? department. Smoke detector ordinance, which to my knowledge, between her husband being a president and also owning some rental units, that they would be, there would be some financial loss if there would have been, if it would have passed. Uh, that seems awfully conjectural to me. And I guess if somebody had a concern at that time, it should have been raised, I guess, at that time. Uh, but uh, in uh, doing some research several weeks ago, uh, preparation for the last time the Committee of the Whole met, I, I looked at, and it's a pretty good source, it's on the website, Government Accountability Board uh, publishes uh, legal opinions that they issue. They issue opinions uh, when requested by local governments. Um, and they, they publish those opinions. And there's, there's a couple that I think are relevant to, uh, to the council that uh, are worth keeping in mind. Um, one, one comment that uh, this was made in a 2002 ethics opinion, uh, in the absence of anything other than conjecture about an effect as far as personal effect on an individual. Public policy favors a public official's exercise of official duties. So really, you're elected to act in the governmental interest. That's a strong public policy for you to take action and not to just uh, say, I'm going to abstain. Uh, sometimes it's easy to abstain when it's a difficult issue, but uh, unless you know, so uh, don't abstain at the drop of a hat. It's uh, really your duty to, to act on legislative issues. Uh, this, this went on to say, <clears throat> this had to do with uh, a, this was a county board official apparently, owning some property adjacent to property that the county owned and the county was going to decide whether to uh, build a public facility on this land adjacent 
to the property that the county board member owned. And the issue was whether or not that created uh, an ethics violation for this county board member uh, to vote because he had the adjoining property. And, and again, uh, the, uh, the Government County Accountability Board punted on the ultimate decision, saying in the absence of anything other than conjecture about that effect, public policy uh, favors the public uh, officials' exercise of official duties, and that the factual assessment is important, but it's not one we can make. But the official, at his or her discretion, may abstain from participation if the official believes participation is likely to undermine citizen confidence in the, the governmental decision. So they give uh, three scenarios. Uh, if the building, building the public facility on adjacent property will or is reasonably likely to have a financial effect on the official's land, the official should abstain from participation. In the absence of any financial effect, the official should participate. And if the effect is conjectural or attenuated, the official should participate unless in the official's judgment to do so would undermine public confidence in the decision or in government. So uh, if, if it's an attenuated situation or you're not sure, uh, but you think uh, could vote, but you're concerned that uh, taking action could undermine public confidence in the decision, uh, or in government, uh, the ethics board is saying uh, may want to abstain in a case like that. So uh, I think these are pretty good concepts that as a general rule, it's your duty as, as an alderman to take action on these issues. But there are situations under our ethics code, and you need to look at the ethics code uh, where abstention is appropriate if uh, there's a direct or indirect personal or financial interest, uh, or if uh, uh, such interest would tend to impair your particular judgment. Attorney McLean, we have a question. Alderman Belk. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Steve, is there anything about materiality in that? I mean, these, these smoke detectors in a two-income household, the price of a few uh, smoke detectors may not even be material to their annual budget, or is that not, an, not a consideration? Uh, well, sure, I think it is. Uh, I think you look at the personal or financial interest. Is there really a personal interest? You know, how, how much of an interest is it? Uh, is it conjectural? Is it, uh, is it real? Is it substantive? I think those all uh, weigh in the mix. So there could have been 10 other fine reasons that she would choose to vote against that, even though it was in her material interest, but if that material interest were small, it could be outweighed by these other fine reasons to be against the, uh, um, the smoke detectors. Um, not necessarily. If, uh, if, if it's a, a personal interest, if you've got any old person has a, a personal interest or a financial interest, uh, they should seriously consider whether to abstain or not. Okay. And just one more comment, Ms. Brother. Yeah. So I, th I think we've... Uh, um, Alder Person Kittleson has heard these concerns from the citizenry. She's reached out to the attorney more so than any other alderman on uh, making sure when she votes. I think she's been put on notice by the citizenry that, hey, we're watching your votes. But she's an important vote. We're very divided on this issue, so every vote counts. And so she's going to make a deal with her constituency. She's going to vote or not vote based on what she thinks her uh, deal with her constituency is. And, and, and then they'll be able to hold her accountable in the next election. I, and so I think now she's been put on notice that people are paying very close attention and she'll take that into her consideration in future votes. I think that that's probably right and I think there's clearly no ethical violation here other than the fact that people are watching. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could indulge. Uh, there was one other opinion that I thought was kind of interesting that it deals with uh, matters that uh, may apply to an individual but also apply to the entire community. And, this was an ethics opinion that goes back to 1998. Uh, it was then called the Wisconsin Ethics Board, but it says the Ethics Board advises that a member of a municipality's governing body who lives in an unsewered subdivision may, consistent with the statute, which is the local governmental ethics statute, participate in a decision whether to require the extension of water and sewer service in all, to all existing and future development in the municipality. So there, uh, even though this person lived in an unsewered subdivision 
and the decision was to require the extension of water and sewer service to all existing, which would impact this individual. Uh, but since it applied totally across the board, um, the ethics board at least took the opinion in 1998 that that was not a violation of the ethics code. So, uh, uh, one, one thing uh, I would suggest if individual aldermen have questions, uh, we've got the, the ethics board and uh, perhaps this is something we should look at uh, redrafting as well. Uh, it's somewhat of a cumbersome process under the code for an alder person to request an advisory opinion from the ethics board. Uh, but that's called for in the ordinance. Uh, any alderman can request an advisory opinion from the ethics board. It's a confidential opinion. Uh, and, uh, but I guess what I would suggest short of that uh, is if you've got an issue, give our office a call. We'd be happy to discuss it with you uh, and try to work through any particular issues that you may have uh, before the matter comes up. I think it's generally helpful to do that. So, not saying we're always going to have the right answer or not. I, my, and this has been uh, reiterated a couple times in the past meeting, my general philosophy is err on the side of caution. Uh, I would prefer in ethics matters not to walk the fine line, but I guess when push comes to shove, there, somewhere there is a fine line, and the ethics board, which is all of you, will have to make that decision perhaps someday as to which side of the line somebody is on, but I guess I think the, the better approach, the approach I advise, is try not to stay you know, right at that line, try to err on the side of caution, but, but bear in mind the principles I've talked about, the, your public, uh, your duty as a public official, uh, the fact that you're all coming to the council and your jobs with a certain amount of bias, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and uh, talk to us and or ask for an advisory opinion from the ethics board. Uh, if, uh, if in doubt. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Uh, if I may, um, one comment was made that uh, the alderman did not come to defense of Alderman Versi. Uh, I believe the vote was unanimous not to proceed. That sounds pretty much like we came, not necessarily to your offense, but we found absolutely no reason to pursue it. Um, I want to go on record saying that, that um, the questions that were brought up in that case of personal financial gain uh, this council found that there was no reason to co continue beyond that. Uh, and uh, the opposite side of what um, uh, Attorney McLean had just said is that, therefore, it's his responsibility to continue to vote uh, um, when appropriate and not to vote when in that question. So I want to clarify that, that we did come to the defense because we felt it wasn't a strong case and we needed to move on from there. Sorry to drag you back through there again, rehash what we did two weeks ago, but uh, again, it was unanimous. There was no question about that. Um, second thing we heard about is bias. A lot, and I, uh, my own personal take on that uh, is kind of rehashed. We've already heard uh, that we all come with biases. Um, if someone was elected <coughs> because they're a business owner, um, I find it ridiculous to say that they shouldn't vote on business issues. Uh, they're, ele they're elected with that expertise. And we hope to have that expertise to use in the council. Alderman Wagaman is an ex um, police officer. I think it would be ridiculous for you to say, you know what, all that experience you have, we don't want. You know, um, you know, you you fought crime in the city, and uh, I, I don't think that it would be appropriate for you not to vote on the police issues, uh, as well. I mean, I, we all have biases, um, and be aware of them. Um, if there's any again personal or financial gain that comes off of that, uh, that's <coughs> a different story. But uh, um, um, the other thing, is, uh, as Attorney McLean pointed out, there was actually no uh, ethics claim in the two communications. Um, as chairman of the committee of the whole, and again, that can be overruled. Uh, I will not be scheduling um, further uh, complaints as such unless there is an actual claim of this impropriety. Uh, again, so I'm not saying that I, we don't want to sit here and do that again, but now we've got two older persons that have gone through issues that I don't know how this vote's going to go tonight, but in the first one was unanimous not to pursue. Uh, so if there's an actual claim, we'll go on from there, um, and we'll certainly allow the public to do so, but we have work to do. Uh, and, I, and I don't want to sit here 14 more times for the other 14 of us, all the persons here in this, well, 13 right now, I guess, um, going through this process again, unless there's an actual claim that we can move on to ethics board 
uh, swear people in, take subpoenas, uh, gather information, uh, and move on from there. Um, Having said that, we have some lights, so I must have touched a hot button. Alvin Wangman. Just a, just a very short comment. Uh, Attorney McLean has made it quite clear that there really is no ethics violation here. And I've seen Alderman, older person Kittleson work many times, and uh, I think I, for one, can trust her judgment in these matters, because I think what we're looking at is not violations, but judgment. And there's no way to legislate judgment and in the past she's shown pretty good judgment so i think in the future i'll i'll trust her judgment on these matters thank you the other one alderman born uh thank you mr chairman i would like alder person kittleson to uh just comment on the proceedings so far tonight if she would and also i would also like her to comment on how she reaches her decision on voting on fire department <coughs> ambulance issues thank you On, on fire department things, always I, I've always gone to Attorney McLean. Um, the first year that I was was an alderman, when my husband was on the fire department, I abstain. I was very skittish about everything pertaining to the fire department. I'd, I'd always ask for uh, a clarification on things. I never voted on insurance matters. I never voted on retirement issues. Um, uh, um, anything pertaining to salaries, I abstained from entirely. He retired then, December 31st, 2005. Um, I would also, at, at that time, since that time, I would always go to the attorney asking for clarification on things when fire department issues came up. If I thought there was a problem, or he would, the attorney would always help me, uh, talk me through it or help me. And he, there were a number of times where he would say, Gene, you don't have to abstain from that. Please, you, you need to vote on that. And I abstained anyway. Uh, um, that being said, uh, um, like I, I would always ask for Steve's, Steve's opinion on things. Um, going back here, let me just see. Um, I did vote um, on the fire station number five. That was December 6, 2005. But I, I, I know that I asked Steve's opinion on that. There was no monetary, you always have to be careful. What's the monetary gain for you? What's the personal, what's the personal gain? Um, then I voted on the ambulance May 29th, 2007. Um, John was gone from the department at that time. There was no personal gain from, he was never involved in, it, in any of the uh, ambulance talks or any of, the, any of those issues. So I felt it was my duty to, to, to vote on that. Um, as, as attorney said, rather than abstaining, you need to vote on these issues. So. You need, to, you need to make that decision. Um, the, the smoke detector ordinance, that, there were a lot of constituents who called on that. That was, that was a, a contentious issue. I never, um, I voted on what I the, made the best decision based on what the, the citizens who had called me had talked to me about. And, and that's what I based it on. So that, that being said, I, I will continue to talk to the attorney whenever there's an issue. Um, and that's my stand. Thank you, Alan Kittleson. Yep. There are no more lights on at this time. Oh. Uh, Alderman Balk, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I thought I had knocked it. I was just uh, going to ask. I'm sorry. Uh, in. Um, are we taking these two together? I mean, it might be more, I, I don't see that there are different documents. I just don't know if the motion is to take them as one. Yes, yes. M the motion was to take them as one. Yes. Okay. And the second. There you go. All right, Thank so you. it's together. Thank you. All right, motion's been made and seconded uh, to file the documents. May I ask who made the motion? Okay. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Becker, okay, thank you. All, right, all in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, opposed? Motion carries. All right, we have a discussion of possible action on resolution calling for referendum regarding abandoning the city's current ambulance service. 8-37 uh, from Alderman Bauer, Longman, and Heidemann. Gentlemen, who would like to go first? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to approach the uh, chair and I'd like to pass out some information. Some of the aldermen have received it, but not all of them. So you haven't received it. Also at this time, I would ask permission that uh, uh, other people be allowed to speak on this, namely uh, Pat Aholm, 
uh, Gary Maples and uh, a CPA, Faye Arainer. Uh, would they be allowed to speak on, on this too? Because they were part of the process that I asked them to help me with the information that uh, <clears throat> Oliver Mengisha requested that we come in with some financial information and I didn't feel I was qualified to do that, so I... Uh, I would make a motion to open to the floor to the, to the citizens that Alderman Bauer would like second. to ask. speak. Motion made and second to open the floor. Is there any discussion on that motion? Alderman Longman? This is on the motion to open the floor? Yes, okay. I'd uh, just like to make the suggestion possibly that we put a time limit on each speaker so that uh, everyone has a fair chance at this, I would request that the uh, chair rule on that. Uh, thank you, Alderman Wangaman. Um, the motion I made to open the floor, did, would the people I would make, make a motion? I would make a motion that we use the rule that we do at public forum. Five minutes each? Five minutes with a request for six if they need it. That'll be at the option of the, of the um, members. I would second. second. I would second that. Okay, so the original, the original, the original motioners, uh, Warren and the second by Versi, um, had amended their motion. All right, all in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 In favor of what's aye opposed? Motion carries. Continue. At this time, I, I would like uh, uh, Pat Aholm to uh, address the uh, council. In the meantime, I will uh, pass out information. Ms. Ahilm, if you'll wait just one moment while I get my stopwatch, so there's no confusion. <laughs> <laughs> I have to power the phone up first so we can continue. So just be a moment yet. <laughs> it's taking a while. Mr. Chairman, for the record, while you're getting that ready, could we have the uh, woman's uh, name and also her address for the record? Oh, absolutely. Ms. Ahlm? It's Patricia Ahom, 2602 A Camelot Boulevard. 2602 A. All right, you have five minutes. Okay, this is an email that I sent this noon to every alderman. Um, some of the people may not have gotten it because I sent it to the new um, email address and um, I'm not sure if you were all using that yet or not. But tonight is your last opportunity to correct the injustice done by the Sheboygan Common Council back in 2007 when those members took it upon themselves to eliminate a financially responsible and cost-saving contract with a private ambulance service that was providing excellent service to the citizens of the city, only to create more jobs and hire more personnel at a huge cost increase for the Sheboygan Fire Department. The taxpaying residents of Sheboygan had no say in the matter at that time. And if they would have, I'm certain the Sheboygan Fire Department would not now be the major focus of enormous deficit spending in the city's budget. The only way to correct this financially unsuccessful error of the past is to vote tonight to approve resolution calling for a referendum on the November ballot to allow the majority of our taxpaying citizens to decide who should handle ambulance service in this city. Why are you so afraid to let the voters make the decision? If you feel so certain that the Sheboygan Fire Department is the proper entity to continue with the ambulance service, then let the voters confirm your choice. By not passing this resolution for referendum to abandon the city's current ambulance service, you only prove that you're afraid the outcome will show a very poor decision was made by the council members back in 2007. I don't know who was all on that council when it was determined the firefighters should get into the ambulance business, but now is the time to trust your constituents and give them the opportunity to make the ultimate choice that will save much needed money down the road and in the long run. Yes, getting out of the ambulance business will mean the four firefighters just hired by Mayor Ryan's split casting vote will lose their jobs. But if you wouldn't always be putting the cart before the horse in order to shove your ideas down the taxpayers' throats, 
there would have been no need to lay anyone off. The Sheboygan Fire De Department ambulance matter is not a money-making venture for the city, as the chief keeps trying to show with his ever-changing fuzzy numbers. It is an expensive burden that we cannot afford, and it's time you allow the people you are supposed to represent to show you the financially feasible way to go on this issue. Thank you. And may I just make one more comment? Um, Still have two minutes, so go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, my brother lives on 10th and End Court, and I called him before I came to this meeting and asked him to contact his older person. I assumed it was um, Marilyn Montemayor, and it's not. It is Scott Versi. And he said that they, therefore, don't even have a chance to voice their opinion on this because they have called Scott Versi and told him what their opinion was and he doesn't get to vote on it. He doesn't get to represent the people from his district that want this um, referendum to be put on the ballot. So there is an opposite effect of what we had with Alder Person Kittleson. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Alderman Bowers is next. Thank you, Tom. Mark, you got one. I've got one, Tom. Thank you. Mr. President, or, uh, Mr. Chair, my, my document from Jerry Maple seems incomplete. Huh. It seems, Pardon? Like it's only, it seems like it's missing the beginning. I've only got the very page. Oh, you got the, the uh, of Gary Maples. The, uh, first yeah. two pages? Yeah, so do I. I think that's all yep, we all have. Same thing. Yeah, I, I think, think we're that's all we have. Yeah. Did you use one of these pages? Yeah. No, that's all I got. Those, those three pages mine, are the mine complete report. On, with Gary Maples, with Gary Maples, mine starts oh, with number oh, three. Oh, well, no, that's, we'll, we'll go with this. It's the three pages. That's it. Okay. That, that, three that is it. Three? Those three yep. pages are it. Yep. One of each color. I went before the uh, finance committee approximately uh, two weeks ago. And at that time, uh, Mr. Gisha indicated that uh, the Finance Committee would like some financial information. I'm also gonna call upon two other people that are professionals that have more information and uh, were able to dissect some of the information uh, given to the aldermen and the people regarding the ambulance. And that will be uh, Faye Rayner, who's company is Innovative Solutions. She's a local CPA and she will give, give you new information. And also Gary Maples, who uh, I believe this is what everybody knows. He is a local businessman and is uh, president of the Greater Sheboygan Committee. So they will be adding to these remarks. There are three pages here that I've taken. And some of you said, well, you don't have page two. What I've done is I photocopy. The first page is a letter that was read to the Finance Committee uh, approximately two weeks ago, kind of self-explanatory. And I believe uh, uh, Faye Rayner will elaborate on this. The second page is 2009, it shows the revenues and expenses. 2009, we had revenues, or two, let's take 2008, revenues $620,505.51. Expenses $421,003.30. Uh, $421, 
2009, $806,313.09 in revenue and expenses of $551,680.37. It, um, at this time, you, you can see that in 2008, made approximately $200,000 based on the accounting used by the city. 2009, the, the net was 254000 which uh, uh, <clears throat> in, in response to questions that we had $400,000 profit. So you can see by that in itself, we fell far short of the projections that were given to the council back in um, 2007. <clears throat> the last page shows projected revenues for 2010 of 892,000 this would develop revenue per employee of $158 and roughly 12 cents. This is based on four employees that we were uh, told that they had to hire to run the ambulance service. Industry average per employee is $65,000, which you can see Sheboygan is way ahead of the game because we are really a money-making organization and uh, apparently the rest of the country hasn't caught on to how to do this. So with that, I am going to uh, leave it up to you. I think the next person I would like to have come up would be uh, Mr. Maples. And uh, you want, okay, uh, I'm sorry, Faye Rayner, the uh, local CPA. And I would ask her to come up and uh, she can elaborate on some of these figures. Thank you, Tom. I should share the. Ms. Rayner, I will need your uh, name and address, please. Sure. Uh, Faye Urainer, 727 North 37th Street, Sheboygan. You will have five minutes. Okay. Um, I passed out two sheets of paper, one green and one white. Has everyone received those? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't have an every, for enough for everyone. If anyone would like some, look me up. I will give you a copy, definitely, no problem. So I'm not going to quite address those yet, but what I would like to say is um, I, I've been working with businesses for over 25 years. I kind of know, I guess, having that CPA is I, I kind of know what I'm doing with finance stuff. So what, what I want to focus on today, I got from Nancy Buss, our Deputy Finance Director today, I got a number from her, I said, what is our cash balance? What's, our, what's the balance in our checking account? And she gave me that number, it's $136,529. It's A on the green sheet. Okay, what that means is, that's how much money we have in our checking account and on a cash basis. What we've been hearing is we've got, we've been making money with the ambulance service. And my understanding is we, we started out where the, there was some money given to the ambulance service to pay some expenses. That money was paid back. And to date now there's 136,000 sitting in the checking account. Usually when we're evaluating businesses, the checking account is kind of the, the key where you can't really fudge that too much as far as where things are going, where expenses are being allocated. So it's kind of nice we do have a checking account for the, separately for the ambulance service. So what I'd like to point out, my first point is the ambulance service has not made 400,000 revenue over expenses. Techli technically using the word profit is inaccurate. Government entities don't, don't have a profit. Okay, thank you. So what we do have though is, is an accounting system which as a government agency we can kind of do what we want to with our accounting and it can be okay. There, we have audited financial statements but we don't have to 
break out everything. And as you could see on the green sheet, and, and this is what really bothered me about the whole situation is we have zero ambulance expenses, okay? The vehicles that were being used in the first year was zero, okay? Yes? I think the reason for that is the lease payment hit in year two. Right. It was paid in year two, right. but if we're looking at one year, we've got zero expense. Right. And that's communicated to people to say we've got 400 profit the first year. I actually, we communicated that information where I said, you know, it's just not plausible. And that's why I got involved. I'm not a member of, you know, I'm not at all affiliated with the Orange Cross or with um, <clears throat> the fire department or anybody. Um, I'm an independent and I'm, I'm here today as a citizen saying, I'm <laughs> tired of hearing all the information and misstatement and as an auditor, as, as an accountant, as a CPA, I, find, I have found it offensive that we would say the government is making a $400,000 profit every year, but we have $136,000 in our bank account. So help me see where, where we're, that profit is going then, because it's not going back to the general fund. Do you under, I hope everyone understands that. We don't have money going back to the general fund. We have a paper profit, the 300 some thousand dollars, a paper profit, it's not hard money, that's going back into the general fund. Okay. I really don't wanna to talk too much about what I wanna talk about, but I really wanna know if you have any questions for me, so please feel free to ask that. Yes, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, complete cost basis versus marginal cost basis. Um, I think when the council started to account for this, I'm led to believe we're using a marginal cost basis. Is that inappropriate? Well, I believe it's very inappropriate when trying to make a decision on whether something is profitable or not. It's typically used in business to say, okay, you know, we've got a real small unit over here, we're gonna apply just, just the basic cost. And if I were to give an example, I'd say, yeah, your son or daughter wants a lemonade stand. You're gonna foot the bill for the lemonade, you're gonna buy the cups, and they're just gonna go out there and make profit. I'm, and, gonna, I'm gonna give my brilliant management advice for free. <laughs> and you're gonna give them your management advice or parental advice of what not to do. So yes, and that's, that's just my very simple example okay. of that. But, but oh, yeah. go ahead. From an accounting standpoint, neither one's necessarily wrong. They're accepted accounting practices. They're accepted, correct? right? And as you can see here today, you know the word audit uh, causes all kinds of mis uh, misinformation. The, war the you know the, the how things are represented can be very different. And I talked with Nancy Buss specifically about that. I said, why, you know, why was the no ambulance cost? I mean, the the, the lease was was incepted in 07, why was there nothing in 08? She said, we talked with the auditors about that. We could have done it, done it either way. Mm -hmm. And we've also looked at a variety of other ambulance services throughout the country, and they do their accounting all different ways. There's really no consistency. And I said, I realize that, and that's why we've kind of looked at this more in comparison to what the industry business has in relationship to um, what the numbers should be. And really, in summary, I, I don't know how many minutes I have here, but I was thinking, I was thinking this through. The Mr. government Rainer. could take over a local homeless, homeless shelter Mr. and Rainer, show it You're actually money. over five minutes, but I'm allowing it because of the questions. I would, I would vote to give her another minute. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Carry on. Getting very warm up here and I don't want to faint, so. That would be a little dramatic. Very dramatic. Okay, so we have paramedics that can help. <laughs> oh, that would be good. <laughs> All right, um, but my point is, we could, as a government, as the city government, take over the local homeless shelter and show a profit doing that. Okay. Now, whether that's really true, you know, it, it's just not true. And we, and and I feel we've done this with the ambulance service, and really distorted from an accounting standpoint, um, what what's really happening with that situation. Can I have a alderman about Lauren first? Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Uraner, I wanna ask, ask you a question on, a, on an issue that I've always had difficulty with and I did some research on this myself and that is the, uh, the Fond du Lac Fire Department in, in uh, uh, delegating their cost, for example, 
they delegate 75% of their paramedics time to the ambulance side of the business and 25% of their time to the fire department. Our fire department delegates, and, and they're making well over 2,000 calls a year, whatever the number is. Our fire department is delegating 25% of the paramedics' time to the ambulance side of the equation and 75% to the fire department. Now, if you, were, if, you were looking, if you were looking at the books of the ambulance service, would you question how that could possibly be possible, how they're delegating, delegating the time of the paramedics when they're making over 2,000 calls a year, but yet supposedly they're only delegating 25% of the cost of the paramedics to the ambulance side and 75% to the fire department where, and again, I guess just because Fond du Lac does it, it doesn't make it wrong, but it seems to me if Fond du Lac is making probably the same number of calls we are and their, their finance director over there decided that, you know, if you're really going to take a true look at the cost, we ought to be delegating the amount of time that they're actually spending on ambulance calls, and they consider that to be 75% on the ambulance and 25% to the fire, and we're doing just the opposite. If you'd like to comment on that, please. Well, this has been an area of contention when we've discussed this, but I am convinced that we are greatly under valuing the salaries and benefits on the modified accrual accounting process. I reviewed this and I'd be happy to go into it in detail, but I think I will bore you all to death. Um, <laughs> and that's why on this green sheet, I've added where we could be adding a normalized cost and we would at least be doubling our wages for what we have there. And I, I understand the, the, the chief's position on that, but I still believe this would be even conservative. Uh, I think I can answer uh, to some degree as well. Um, if, for example, the ambulance service was discontinued tomorrow uh, and we laid off 25% of our firefighters who were left with 75%, um, then it's an appropriate costing because, uh, again, using marginal, that's the cost that the city has. Uh, the increased cost would be the 25%, which is why they're, I believe they're doing the 25% of that. If it was the other way around, if we uh, got rid of the ambulance service and we could lay off 75% of the firefighters, uh, then I think it would be appropriate you know, to, to go in a different direction. But I think that's, that's one way of looking at it is, is the, the marginal cost is that we have a fire department. Uh, yes, they're doing more of their work on the ambulance service, but getting rid of the ambulance service, what amount, I mean, we have the budget 100% then, and what is that number? It's about 75% of the, their total budget right now. If I could just follow up. Please. What, Fondal, what, Fondal Act, what the Fond du Lac Fire Department and their finance department has decided to do is hypothetically, if the cost of running the ambulance service for the Fond du Lac Fire Department is $1.2 million, and that's a hypothetical, uh, hypothetical figure, at the end of the year, the city of Fond du Lac is telling the citizens of Fond du Lac, it costs us $1.2 million to be in the ambulance business. However, because of that expenditure, and this is a hypothetical figure again, we are putting, as a result of being in the ambulance business, $400,000 into the general fund. And, I, and that has always been a contention with me and a lot of citizens. Why can't we just give the citizens of Sheboygan what it is actually costing us to run the ambulance business and say, oh, by the way, at the end of the year, we're putting in $400,000. I think a lot of people would be satisfied if that's the way it's being reported. A lot of people don't understand this marginal cost. And it's been a bone of contention with a lot of people since day one. The marginal cost is the way to do that, unfortunately, and it is confusing, and that's the problem. Um, you know, again, your example, 1.2 million, um, and we're adding the 400,000 to the general fund. Um, the cost is only the difference between having a fire department and having a fire department and an ambulance service, the in in increased cost. And those numbers have been given, I believe. We've had those for a while. Um, Alderman Hanna, you're next. I just have a quick question. Uh, let's assume we, we switch to a complete cost basis. Mm -hmm. And humor me for a moment. Okay. And, and let's keep the numbers round. Let's say that um, with the ambulance revenues involved with the fire department, it has the potential of generating 300000 to the general fund. And we shift costs from regular fire department over to ambulance. 
So ambulance now shows a break even or deficit. Would the fire department have excess cash flow then to contribute to the general fund? Making the assumption of 300,000. Certainly not. The, the, the ambulance serv or the fire department is not a profit making entity. No, no, I didn't use profit. Or a, I mean, the ability to contribute back to general fund. No, certainly not. And actually, that 300, all that's really doing is coming out of that, the fire department budget. That's, it's just saying, okay, we're taking that paper money and we're taking it out of the fire department bunny, budget in total or the money that it's showing up on the statements. So again, paper money, um, not, not real. I do have an issue with that marginal cost because I, I really don't believe we really are including all of the marginal costs. And I've got some communication out to our deputy finance director. You know, I know there's insurance costs that we've had to get in addition. Those aren't on here. And apparently that my understanding is that marginal cost method was decided by a group of non-accountants who decided let's figure out how to and I don't mean to insult anybody, I, that's okay, um, but a group of non-accountants that decided this is what we're gonna do without input from someone that may have a little bit more knowledge in that area. And you can, and, and that's basically what I also got from the Deputy Finance Director, it was decided this is how we will do our accounting. So they're not doing anything wrong, they were doing how it was decided by a group of people how to do that accounting. <coughs> All right, there are no more lights. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So then what, and we have $136,529 in the checkbook? What in the checkbook. So we do, that's money that we have, correct? That's money that we have. I'm not positive if there was money originally given out to the, to the, finance, to the ambulance service to start up. I, my understanding was that was given back and some of that might have been used. Um, but but that's, we do have this right yes. now. So However, if I may add, I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, um, what that means though is we've allocated four people to this, um, this report, four people. Now, if we really related that to real life, um, the numbers, well, I happen to know, kind of perusing some information that uh, was public that um, the, the nonprofit ambulance service let go nine people. So we replaced nine people with four. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that logic. Because they are running, I, I have looked at the, some public financial information, they are running a lean organization. And it's a nonprofit. And they have been a nonprofit, I believe, for 14 years. Okay. And I, I know I, I hear the citizens, I hear people talking about this all the time and I felt for me this is just an, an issue I need to, to step on and get involved with. And I realize you have auditors, you could ask them some questions. Um, you have your finance director, um, you have your, your fire chief. Um, however, I, I also realize that finance issues are difficult and perhaps when, when the council has those, maybe, maybe talking to some advisors, whether again it be your audit team or maybe even the Greater Sheboygan Group, our, our group of uh, business leaders who understand finances and have access to people like myself that understands numbers very, in very great detail. Ms. Rainer, your six minutes are up for um, opinion, um, but we're using right now as an as a expert, uh, so please stick to answering the questions. Alderman Balcom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, I gotta be careful here because I'm now on the opposite side of this issue, so I have to be careful because I don't want to. Are you indicating I, a bias? I don't want to diminish <laughs> her input because she's making my new case for me. But I, gotta, I have to caution our guest that she is a latecomer to this conversation and she is missing a great deal of information about the history behind this. So to catch her up, um, the whole efficiency lean thing, Mr. President, has everything to do with the city had a million dollar overhead advantage. There was no will of the people at the time to get rid of um, the, uh, help me out, uh, Dulce, there were either 15 uh, firemen or 15% of the fire force, I forget what, but there was a move afoot to say, hey, they're not that busy, let's get rid of the uh, mem several members of the fire department. 
There was no political will of the people to make that happen. So what the, or, the group that uh, passed, and then this, this council that passed the fire department issue, um, decided uh, that it made financial sense. And one of the reasons was because there was a million dollar overhead benefit. We already had buildings to put ambulances in. We already had very qualified uh, paramedics. And so um, because of that million dollar overhead advantage, stuff that wouldn't go away because we couldn't get rid of the firemen at the time, and so we didn't have those additional expenses, and, and Orange Cross did, that gave us a million dollar uh, overhead advantage over Orange Cross. And that's why we were able to implement it by hiring four additional people and leasing three ambulances. So again, I, I realize that you're late coming to this conversation, but I have a great suggestion, and that is we would love to have someone with your investigative techniques and your knowledge of numbers apply for our director of finance job in the city, because <laughs> Lord knows we need one that has the bandwidth to pursue questions like this. The honorable thing you do is to not take the benefits package. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Go pay I, I'm half. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll graciously need to decline that. Um, that question, the million dollar overhead, I, I realize you have infrastructure and yeah. such to deal with. Again, we could, we could probably house some of the homeless people there. Now, is that something you want to do? You know, is that, is that a part of the argument? That, I guess that doesn't generate income. Whether, and again, we probably are too cavalier with the word profit, and, and there are people who use it inappropriately. I don't think any of the three people who weren't aware of numbers that were involved in the creation of this program, I don't think any of us have used the, the word profit inappropriately. I think right. we've been very cautious to use words like it provides an income stream, it offsets its own expenses on a marginal cost basis, it returns more than it sucks up. Right. Uh, and again, just uh, com uh, for complete disclosure, I'm on the other side of that issue now because <laughs> Uh, as a first-term freshman alderman, I was naive to the very expensive long-term proposition that hiring new firemen meant at the time. So again, I'm not trying to disprove uh, Ms. Uramer, uh, Uraner's uh, uh, argument here, because she's doing a, a good job of, of doing what I hope will, will happen. But I, I'd, I'd caution you to be a little bit more tentative in the words that you choose, because you're missing some valuable pieces of information. And I appreciate that. I, I do. Whether or not they're making money, I thought this was, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. I, I admit that when it comes to numbers, I'm probably not the brightest candle on the cake in the room here, but uh, I'm wondering, are we straying off the question here? I thought the question was whether we're going to have a referendum or not, to put it very bluntly. Sure, um, you, you are correct. Uh, however, two committees that this was referred to uh, did not have information uh, within those committee structures uh, and asked Alderman Bowers to provide that information at this session. Uh, so I'm simply providing that resource uh, that the other committees did not have, which of course the members are here today. Uh, you are right, I'd like to keep uh, you know, a little more focused on the, uh, the issue at hand. Uh, there are questions about the referendum that we think we need to discuss. Um, I think we have yet to discuss the referendum, yeah, actually. Yet. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and I kind of wish we would get onto that. Uh, <laughs> all this financial information to me can be presented. Supposing this does get on the ballot, that's the time I would think to present all this information so that people can make an informed choice. And uh, I certainly would be all for that. We'd have like two and a half months or so to uh, put out our positions to our various constituents. And from what I've been able to observe out there, this very simply can be called a very hot button issue. And people out there have very, very strong opinions on this. And I, I think it behooves this committee to uh, get back to the question, if you would, and let's decide whether or not we're going to allow the people of Sheboygan to speak their piece or not. I think that's what this is all about. Uh, Alderman Bourne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was going to make a, a motion on the resolution, but I didn't want to preclude Mr. Maples from speaking if he wanted to. I would, I would yield to Mr. Maples if he wants to make any comments. Otherwise, I'm prepared to make a motion with an amendment to the uh, resolution. We have two more lights. Um, if you want to make the amendment, you may do so. Uh, I'm um, going to make a motion to... Uh, uh, make a, a favorable recommendation to the council to go ahead with the uh, referendum, uh, but I do want to amend it. And uh, the, the thing I want to amend is the last sentence of the of the resolution where it says January 1st, 2011. I want to change that to January 1st, 2012. And under s discussion, I'd like to give reasons for making that motion. Go ahead. The reason for making that motion is that if this does go on the ballot, if we choose to make a recommendation for this to go on to the ballot, 
and the election is November 2nd, there's a very, very short time frame between November 2nd and, uh, and January 1 of 2011 if the decision of the citizens was for us to get out of the ambulance business and give this back to the private sector. However, I would feel more comfortable if the date was changed to 2012 because it would be my intention uh, as a member of the Finance Committee uh, to recommend that if the citizens wanted to get out of the ambulance business and get it back into the private sector that this be put out for bid. It's going to be impossible to get this out for bid to private contractors with the due diligence that Bernie Romer does. He's very thorough, but when he puts stuff out for bid, and it's going to be darn near impossible for him to get this out to bid, get the bids in, award the contract, and expect, expect the private sector company to be up and running by January 1st, 2011. However, if we change the date, it gives our purchasing director ample time to do di due diligence on the bids, get them out there, get the bids in, uh, have uh, whoever's going to look over the bids uh, make a recommendation to which provider, private provider, would have the ambulance business. This also gives our fire chief, based on the wishes of the public, if it passes that we get out of the ambulance business, for him to make recommendations on restructuring his fire department and then gives the new provider ample time to become the ambulance provider on January 1st, 2012. I just don't think if it would pass in November for us to get out of the ambulance business that there would be ample time to uh, pull this off, you might say. And this is not only a financial concern. On January 1st, 2011, it would be impossible for me to be comfortable with a private provider taking this over and being able to provide prep, uh, the private uh, safety to our, to our, to our citizens. I just think it's too much of a rush job, but I want to make that motion to change that date to 2012 for those reasons. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded to amend the resolution as before us to change the date um, to January 1st, 2012. Um, under discussion, um, I, I can definitely see your point. I think it's an excellent point. If I owned an ambulance service and I knew a city had two months or less, <laughs> I wouldn't get my best bid. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd be a little bit high in my bid knowing that they have no choice to do so. So that'd be a good idea. Um, we have a few people. Uh, Alderman Bowers, you're first. Yes, uh, I, I would be receptive to that, but I think there's too much time. Why don't we just say uh, July 1st, 2011. I think that's plenty of time. That's eight months to put it out for bids and, and get the proper procedure in place. I don't think we need 14 months. So I would like to amend that one to uh, 2000, July 1st, 2011. Um, there's a motion made to, uh, on the amendment. Uh, we'll see if it passes or fails, and then we can add to that uh, accordingly, if you desire. Alderman um, uh, Kittleson? Uh, well, I, I just wanted to say, too, I, we need, I, before I feel comfortable voting on this, I, I would like to know, you know, the financial ramifications, and um, uh, we, we have it here, and I, I guess I'd like, to, I'd like even more uh, information from Faith. Uh, talk to us some more on this. I, well, here my thought was, I, I forgot what my thought was when you were up here. I was talking. Well, I put, I put a um, couple highlighted areas on here, but I didn't um, want Mr. to. Mr. Rayner, uh, if you hold off, we have a motion uh, regarding, oh, and we're going to focus on that question at hand. Sure. So we're just discussing right now the motion. Uh, Alderman Hanna, you're next. Is on the motion. Uh, this is this is just some comments in the motion and some and a suggestion within the context of the motion. Um, when I served on the school board, we did a referendum for one building in gymnasiums at North and South High, um, and initially that was met with a lot of resistance. So there was a real commitment on the part of the school board and some active citizens to hold educational forums to get all the information out. Um, and we've got between now and November. Um, so can I add a friendly amendment that we make a commitment to at least hold five public forums between now and the time it's voted on so that we can educate the public, um, give them the best information that we know? Uh, that's, that's really how we, we did it with the school district. It was 
full disclosure, plenty of room. We had, we had school members for it and school members against it. And it, I just think that, that adding that commitment to public forums is helpful. I would accept that friendly amendment. If, if, if that means a second, I would second that. Mm -hmm. I think that it, I, the, the point that Alderman Hanna makes is very important. Uh, Alderman Wagman, you had seconded the original motion. Um, the the person okay? making the motion amended it to include that they hold five closing sessions, so that would actually have to be written in the uh, resolution, because right now we are amending a resolution. How would you want that worded, Alderman Hanna? Where would you want just uh, add that? A, a commitment on behalf of the Common Council. Uh, or be it further resolved. Or be it further resolved that the Common Council hold five uh, public forums in the neighborhoods of the five fire stations. So the amendment would be two, twofold. First portion of the amendment would be to change the date to January 1st, 2012. Uh, and the second portion would be to add a be it further resolved that the Common Council had five listening sessions prior to the election. Okay. Uh, Alderman Bauck, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one comment and one question. The comment would be, um, uh, and again, no one wants to see this ambulance thing over sooner than I do, but when we, when we stood up the ambulance service, I remember uh, with Chief Lestusky, I think eight months was pretty much pushing how far out in advance we could get equipment and get people trained um, and things of that nature. So again, I'm going to support Alderman Boren's 12-month uh, timeline or 12 or 14, whatever it is, because again, nobody wants to see this thing gone more than I do, but again, an, at an appropriate pace that allows Orange Cross or some other entity to hire the people they'll need, get the equipment they'll need, and get them trained. Uh, and, and it's just my recollection, and Alderman Hanna, you may or may not recall that, but I remember that eight months seemed to be pushing it last time. So that's my it, comment. It, it and was then, pushing it big time. Yeah. And then my question for this body is, do we need to define whether this is a binding or non-binding referendum? Does that, or doesn't it matter? I just, that, neither, that word doesn't appear anywhere in the resolution. I just wondered if it's important. Mr. Chairman. Alderman Longman. I, it, is, it is binding. If you look at the bottom, you have the original document yes, there? Yes, sir. There's words, I don't have the document in front oh, of me, but there's words to the, the effect okay, that, the, so it is binding. that the council shall comply with the, the uh, decision of the people. And I, I checked that out with Attorney McLean, and he said that makes it binding. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Alderman Bowers, you have uh, this on the motion oh. to amend. We'll get to yours yet. I think, uh, I think he has it. Okay. Very good. Uh, any other discussion on the motion, uh, the amendment to the um, resolution? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have an amended document. Uh, Alderman Bowers, you had a motion to amend again. If you'd like to make that motion, now's the appropriate time. Which one are we, would we vote uh, on? Changing to July 6th is the one okay, we're voting on. vote on that first? Uh, it's already been amended to change it to uh, January 1st, 2012. Yeah. But you also wanted to make a motion to now change the, the, what the body just had done and change it to July, is that correct? So your motion is to amend what we've done to July 1st? Yes, and then if, if that fails, then we will have another vote on uh, January 1st, 2012. That's we already, already voted on. 2012 has already been passed. Oh, I see. Yeah, so right. if that's your motion, then is there a second to your motion? Okay, there is no second, so that motion fails. Thank you, Alderman Bowers. Um, okay, uh, now, uh, under continuing discussion, uh, Alderman Boren, you had mentioned that you'd like to hear from Gary Maples at this time. If Gary Maples has anything to say, I would like to open the floor to him. Okay. Uh, Mr. Maples, please come forward. Um, Alderman Wongeman has reminded us that the topic at hand is whether or not to hold the referendum. So if Paul, Paul, Mr. Maples, can we focus on that question at hand, uh, whether to have the referendum or not? All right, Mr. Maples, uh, name and address, please. Gary Maples, Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. I'm also president of the Greater Sheboygan Committee. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I would graciously ask if you would uh, allow me to state my professional qualifications and not include that in the time. Um, you have five minutes. You may throw that in there if you'd like. I right, said so without including it in the five minutes. Um, 
We'll stipulate that he's a well-qualified. He's well-qualified. I think you're well-known. And he is okay. admired by the business community and private citizens alike. Well, thank you, Councilor. We'll, we'll stipulate your qualifications. <laughs> yes. um, you may begin. As far as I, I can't ex perhaps address the referendum issue as exactly as you wanted. I had been approached by Alderman Bowers and by uh, Ms. Rayner to uh, offer my contribution. As far as my, I will mention my professional qualifications. I, I am retired. I've been a president of two different banks. I have uh, economic interests within the city of Sheboygan. Um, I've spent my entire life, 35 years, looking at financial statements. That was my role in the bank, was to analyze and look at the quality of financial statements. To this day, I still teach. Uh, I teach in several different locations in the United States including the uh, University of Wisconsin Graduate School of Banking. So that's my, my background and my credentials. Uh, what I passed out to you is, is, is Mr. Bourne asked for a, a simple answer, and that's what I've tried to do. You will notice I don't have any, as near as many numbers on the page as Missy Rayner does, but did, but I'm not a CPA. Take out the words profit, take out the words contribution, take out the words, all those words that are constantly tossed around because the only thing that counts at the end of the month, at the end of the year, is cash. And what you see on the paper is the net cash position of the ambulance service, cash inflows, in other words, collections and fees, minus cash expenses. For the year 2008, that number is $199,000. However, as Faye pointed out, there's no debt service or lease service in there, so that number is probably double what it would be if the lease payments had been made in the first year. The second year, two, 255000 net for 2009. Does that include the lease payment? That includes the lease payment, that is correct. The 210 budget is for 376. All right, let me elaborate a little bit on that. Let's take 2009. Cash collected was 806, cash expenses was 551. Now, those numbers of cash expenses, 421 in 208 and at 551 in 2009, are based on the accounting system being used. As Ms. Rayner indicated, there are some potential holes and there are some perhaps some marginal costs that are not being captured in the accounting system. So that 551 and that 421 for cash expenses are probably, and I, I agree with Ms. Urainer, considerably higher. Of course, what that does is if it was properly accounted for in that way, it would reduce those net cash lines considerably and perhaps drive them negative. Yes. Would that cash data move to the fire department? Alderman Hanna. General. I would ask that we withhold questions to the end so we don't run into the same problem of uh, with Ms. Urainer about when five minutes is actually up. So write it down, please. <laughs> cash is the focus. Cash is the only thing you can count. Billings don't count, receivables don't count, cash counts. This is cash information, inflows and outflows. Now, what I have some of the same problems, same frustrations that Faye does is so many numbers have been tossed out, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000, 800,000 in the future. None of those numbers mean anything unless you can relate them back to the cash flow. This is the cash flow, it's right here, it's, it's on the page. Now, the last comment, and I hope I'm not pushing my time too closely here, and that is, let's take a look at 2009. If the ambulance service was removed from the fire department, the 806 in cash collected would go away. Now, theoretically, the 551 should go away also, because no, no ambulance service, no, no revenues, no expenses. However, that 551 contains approximately 250,000 of firefighting staff. And if you make the assumption that those people would stay in the fire department once a, a divestiture of the ambulance service occurred, then that hole, that financial hole, so to speak, would be 250 plus 255 or almost 500,000. So that's a reasonable number. However, I'm concerned about that number because again, I've heard if you drop the ambulance service, the hole is 500, <laughs> 600, 700, $800,000 coming from different sources, sitting in these meetings, listening to them. 
There is a $500,000 hole in 2009, based on 2009 numbers, if you drop the ambulance service. But that's with the assumption you will keep all the fire department staff, which is not necessarily a, you know, that's another council issue to, to determine. But Mr. Maples, if you would pause for a second. You need a motion to grant the extra minute. So moved. Second. Motion made okay. second. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Carry on, please. Thank you. Um, that does mean that uh, there would, uh, if the four firefighters would be dropped, you would still have a hole of 255,000 based on 2009 <laughs> numbers. That is less than 3% of the fire department's entire budget. It is not a, do you want to give up $255,000 in income? Not necessarily, but on the other hand, it is not an insurmountable number. Asking expenses, how many of you in your private lives have been asked you know, to take a 15% pay cut? And, and you did it because you had to. So that's, I wouldn't focus on that number as being an insurmountable obstacle. It, it needs to be dealt with. The last thing is, as uh, Terry Hansen uh, pointed out in his uh, paper that he wrote uh, and, and submitted about the uh, next five to 10 years of the fire department, Mr. Um, Maples, your six minutes are up. If you hold please, though, I'm sure there's some questions. Okay. If someone would like to ask him about <laughs> what he's just about to say, <laughs> that might be appropriate. Um, Alderman Hanna? Thank you. Two questions. You answered the first one okay. before. Uh, what's a fair value to sell the ambulance business out that we have? And secondly, if we were to sell it to a <laughs> private vendor, um, what is the fair fee in lieu of taxes to charge that vendor for access to our city? Uh, I can't answer you because I have not researched those areas. I could tell you that that information is available. Great. I do not have it today. Good. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? Alderman Bourne? I would ask the question for you to continue with what you were going to say, <laughs> Mr. Maples. <laughs> As Mr. Hansen's report indicated, the fire department operates at a deficit now. All city departments operate at a deficit. That's nothing new. That's no great revolution. Re revelation, excuse me. What his report says, however, is that deficit is going to grow dramatically in the fire department, regardless of the ambulance service or not. So again, in the short run, it helps. But do not look upon the ambulance service as a long-run panacea that is going to eliminate these uh, growing deficits. And the, what, the reason that drives the deficits is basically personnel costs. All right, thank you, Mr. Maples. Are there any other questions this time? Alderman Buck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, this is great analysis. You're totally right about cash. Um, but to say that 3% is not an insurmountable obstacle is someone who has not sat across from them at the negotiating table. Um, that 3% is a significant obstacle, and they will fight what we are trying to accomplish here, um, even though they are, in the papers, trying to be agreeable. They are working, no, have no doubt that they are working to keep as many firemen on duty as they can. So when someone who is good with numbers says it's not an insurmountable obstacle, practically he's, uh, I mean, the theoretically he's right. Practically, there are obstacles to be surmounted if we end up having to lay off a significant amount of the fire department and getting the political will to do that. That's one. And then two, if you take $400,000, which is, and again, I'm with you to give you a little more history. And Gary, you were around. I'm not sure if Faye was uh, in, as involved at the time. Um, there are expenses missing from that, but that was not because of any sort of uh, malfeasance. What that was was we put the best business plan together. Several aldermen signed off on it. Uh, really, people who are really good with numbers uh, signed off on it, and then we left it up to the good offices of the Department of Finance to make sure that all the costs were allocated. And then there were long conversations driven by citizens and us to make sure those numbers were included. And so three years later, if all those numbers haven't been included, shame on us. But that's not because of any malfeasance upon anybody here. Um, so if you take $400,000 divided by 14,000 homes in Sheboygan, that's about 28 bucks per household to get out of the fire, uh, fire ambulance business. So again, as you communicate with your constituents, ask them if it's worth a couple of Pizza Hut pizzas to get this mess behind us and, uh, and get, uh, get 
Orange Cross back in the, the ambulance business here. And uh, for Alderman Hanna, I'm really interested in, in if that's possible. Can we put this bid out, Mr. President, in a way that forces a contribution in lieu of, uh, of tax? Because they are a nonprofit entity, and all of us, we can have conversations about what that means, but definitely they're in it for profit. Um, it's just not tax profit. So Mark, is that possible, Mark, for us to put that, for Bernie to put that in the thing? Okay, because that would help make this decision a whole lot easier, too, if we can turn some of Orange Cross or some other entity in the future, turn them taking this business over into a revenue stream for the city. That makes it even easier to make and this decision. And this is preaching from Alderman Bourne's gospel, uh, and that is, you know, how do we create, we, we have a lot of nonprofits, and how do you appropriately um, get fees for access to the city to help offset cost of services, whoever does the ambulance, we're plowing the streets. Um, Excellent. You know. That's helpful. Thank you. Attorney McLean, I do have a few questions if you're available. Are you still awake? Because <laughs> 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 it's hot and we're all tired. <laughs> so. Thanks a lot for your no, no problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard to squeeze. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, questions that I have for you are, are really twofold. One ties into uh, Alderman Bauck's uh, conversation here. Uh, the resolution is calling for a referendum, um, uh, and we've already amended it as such to also include listening sessions. Um, would it be appropriate to, if the recommendation is to go to open bidding um, and uh, put requirements within the open bidding, is it appropriate to add it to this now because we would need to take there's such actions as necessary to carry out the decision of the electorate, or do we do that at a later date? Do we set up then the, the bidding guidelines at a later date? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not my decision, that's your decision. I'm not gonna tell you what you should do or shouldn't do, and I'm not a financial person, but uh, that's, that's the problem you have with a binding referendum. It's basically gotta be a simple enough question so that people can make a, an informed decision, yes or no, and it's a yes or no decision. And you know, the more things you throw in there, uh, that is probably a good idea because uh, there's a lot of variables. Uh, but that's, that's your decision. Uh, I was asked to review a draft document. I, uh, it's not my purview to change the, uh, the merits or the content of the document. I was looking at it from the standpoint of uh, format, basically. Uh, if the council chooses to have uh, a, uh, a mandatory referendum, I personally, and it's again, not my purview, I think it's a good idea uh, to provide some time frame in there because uh, as Alderman Bourne pointed out, uh, from November 2nd or 3rd, the date of the election, to January 1, 2011, it's a pretty short time frame. Uh, there's, there's a lot of issues. If the decision is to do away with the ambulance service, uh, then what do you do? That's, that's binding on you, uh, I guess, the question would be then, if that's how the resolution reads and the uh, referendum reads, then I guess you've got to decide, you know, what do you do? Uh, it says we're out of the ambulance business. Does that mean we contract with the uh, private ambulance service? Uh, do we just not do anything and let the private sector fill a void? Uh, I think there's probably going to have to be some negotiation with the county to, uh, as we did before, to get a joint contract. Uh, a lot of issues, uh, and uh, it's all, uh, that's why I think it's very important that you not rush this sort of question, uh, and you take some time to develop an appropriate, if you want to do a referendum, make an appropriate question that, uh, from your standpoint, is uh, intelligible to the public, gives you the information you, you want, and, uh, uh, again, I've had the question asked a number of times, a couple of times, uh, whether or not the council can do this as a binding referendum. Uh, because the issue has come up in the past where uh, citizens have initiated a direct uh, request for direct legislation through petition, and uh, I've given the opinion that the council already acted on it, so it's not an appropriate subject for direct legislation, and therefore you can't take it to referendum. Uh, this is a different scenario. This isn't being initiated by the public or private private citizens. This is a council-initiated 
document. Uh, in my view, my legal opinion, you can make it mandatory, you can make it advisory. Uh, you're not bound by the same uh, proscriptions that there are for the public in, in uh, trying to override legislative dis decisions by the council. Um, but I think all those are questions that are, that need to be uh, uh, analyzed carefully before you make your ultimate decision on, on having a referendum uh, and what you want to include there and uh, how you're going to word it because uh, I think it's very important and as I say, uh, ultimately it comes down to in a referendum question, you can only answer yes or no. And uh, you, know, you can't say, well, maybe if this or that and the other thing. So uh, you make it mandatory, it's, uh, it's all or nothing. So I don't know if I so if answered your question or not. But uh, in summary, if it is the council's goal to put it out for open bid, uh, that should actually be part of the referendum question. So perhaps something to say, shall the city of Sheboygan abandon its fire department based on ambulance service in favor of a private ambulance? Should really say, Sheboygan abandon its fire department ambulance service and go for open bid for the service. Would that be more appropriate? So I'm not sure what. Well, if that's what you want to do, or, or if you want to talk to the county about working with the county cooperatively like we did previously and have a joint contract. In fact, uh, the county took the lead on that contract. Uh, if you say go out for bid, you know, that the council will go out for bid, then you're bound by that if it's a mandatory referendum. Uh, you've got to go out for bid then. So that's the sort of thing that uh, gets a little difficult. All right, uh, questions, Alderman Bowers, you're first. <coughs> no, I'm sorry, Alderman Wagman, you are first. You're second, you're next, Alderman Bowers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think I, I agree wholeheartedly with Attorney McLean that uh, we should keep this document as simple as possible. This is a yes or no question. We, I don't see how we can put something into a document where we say, uh, if, if this resolution or if this uh, a referendum passes, then we'll go out for our bids. Is that what we're saying? I mean, how can we do that? Why don't we just keep it a simple yes or no question? Do you want the ambulance service? Do you want the fire department or don't you? And I think this is, what, this is what we have to stay with. And the more complicated we make this, we're going to over-engineer this thing till we come up with a complicated document that half of us won't understand. So it, Bowers? Keep, it, keep it simple, the KISS principle. I agree. Um, this, let's just keep it simple. Once we start asking uh, ambulance companies if you're going to kick in and if they don't do that, do that, uh, we're getting the cart before the horse. Let's keep this simple. Let the people decide, and then after that, we can do negotiating, and if the negotiations are fruitful, okay, but otherwise, we, we can't be putting all these caveats on, uh, on the ballot because uh, people won't even know what they're voting on. Uh, Alderman Hanna, you're next. Yeah. No, and, and I agree with Tom. Uh, in no way do they want revenue sharing on the ballot. You keep the question clean. You do your education up front. We've got from now until November, what, 14th, 15th? Second. Second. Right. We, we've, we've got a period of time now to get as much information and ramifications out to people. Uh, there's an opportunity in the community for individual people to form uh, interest groups on either side of the issue. And that creates a healthy debate in the community and more flows. Just because we're holding five listening sessions doesn't mean other folks can't do all the educating they want. But I just think it's important as a, as a group, uh, we at least make an effort to communicate as the facts as we know them to as many people as possible so that they can make an informed decision. It's what we try to do with the school district. You know, you, you try to, to give the facts as best you know them at that time. Nobody has a crystal ball about the future. And I think that you keep it simple, but you educate up front. Great. Alderman Born. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm glad Alderman Hanna brought that up about the nonprofits making a contribution for city services. Unfortunately, that the way the law is written is that 
those are voluntary contributions. The only way you're going to get those contributions is when you've got something that they want, and that can be negotiated. To give you an example, the new hospital at Aurora is building down in Grafton. Uh, Aurora agreed to give Grafton, and I don't want to say the figure, but it was a very, very substantial, a lot, a lot big buckaroos. And what, what Grafton is doing now, I believe he's building a public works building or something, a very substantial amount. So definitely, when, if we're going to put this out to bid and we're going to be negotiating, I definitely think we should be getting some future considerations. And in addition to that money that Grafton got, Aurora is paying on a yearly basis for, for uh, a fee in lieu of services, a substantial amount for fire protection, police protection, and public work services. So it's, I think it's very appropriate when the time comes that we have that as part of the negotiations. But that's a separate issue from the, from the, uh, from the referendum. I, don't, I agree we shouldn't cloud this up any more than it is right now. But whatever committee is going to be in charge of that, whether it be finance or strategic fiscal planning, those are all very important parts of the discussion if this goes out to bid. Thank you. Alderman Belk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm politically conflicted um, because I, ideologically I'm against referenda in this matter because it's a complicated issue and I think it's us abdicating our responsibility to have the courage to make decisions. I think we should be making this decision. But in light of the fact that we tried to make this decision before and it didn't go uh, the way that, uh, frankly, I uh, want to see it have another shot at going, I'm willing to uh, give the citizenry their chance, um, and so I'm going to support this. But there are a couple of things that we should make sure we get out there. One is, every time we vote, there are these unintended consequences. Every time government does anything, there are these unintended consequences. And one of the unintended consequences might be, based on the financial reporting that Orange Cross did before we did all this, they were scraping by, their people were underpaid, their people were overworked. Um, they were just a stepping stone to a real paramedic job. These are the things we heard. Um, if we impose or we negotiate some sort of large contribution to our community, uh, that, that may go the other direction. They may not invest in as many ambulances as we want. They may not invest in the training we want them to invest in. So know that if we vote on this tonight and we do away and, and we potentially set us up to get out of the ambulance business, citizenry out there, beware. There may be consequences you're not thinking about. And two, um, what was two? Oh, <laughs> uh, I think we may underestimate the power because we've got a great group here tonight that is being vocal with numbers and facts on a very complicated issue. They may underestimate the power of organized labor to get out the vote on this issue, and you may not like the way this referendum turns out. Uh, so I want you to be considering who has the ability to get the vote out, and if we vote to approve this, and if the good people sitting over there get behind this referendum, you better be ready to match an, uh, an ideological opponent that is ready to defeat this referendum. Uh, and, and so I, I think, again, um, I, I, I'm going to vote for it tonight. It's against my ideological uh, um, uh, predispositions, but I'm considering it a penance for my short-sightedness when, you know, three or four years ago. Thank you, Mr. President. Alan Bowers. Yeah. I call a question. Can we vote? <laughs> Second. Uh, there's a motion to call the question, um, and it has been seconded. Uh, so we will call the question at this point in time. My goal was to have the fire department speak on, on behalf now. Um, be aware of that. They have been sitting all two and a half hours for the chance to speak as well. Um, but uh, the motion's been made, so we need to vote at that point in time now. All in favor of calling the question right now, say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Calling the question. Calling the question. Simply calling the question. We're going to vote on whether or not to have a referendum? To recommend to ourselves. Uh, actually, technically. Without hearing from the fire department? And that's the motion right now, to call the question. Uh, technically, though, um, there is no question called because we've amended. We need to make a motion first to pass the amended uh, resolution uh, at written and second in that. Uh, so right now we've been in discussion with no question. Uh, so someone need to make a motion first. And then the question can be called. Uh, however, again, I would consider we've had people waiting two and a half hours to speak as well. So you need, uh, Mr. Chairman, you need a motion for, for to make a recommendation on the amended resolution. Correct. A recommendation. Because the motion was made first, we've amended it, so we need a we need a motion to pass the amended uh, before going forward. So technically, there's no question to be called. So moved. So motion been made and second, second to pass as amended or to recommend passage as amended. 
Uh, Warren and Balk. Um, any discussion on that? Alderman Montemayor. Um, thank you. You also say this to me again. The question was called to vote on whether or not we have a referendum, or the question is called whether or not we accept Alderman Boren's amendment. Okay, technically the question was called. However, because we have never had a motion to pass as amended, there was no question to be called. So now Boren and Bauke have now made and seconded the motion uh, to recommend to council the passage of as amended. Um, and if someone would like to call a question, they may do so at this point in time, but there has been no question called no. right now. Without input from the fire department. Um, if someone calls the question, again, we need someone to call the question if that's the answer. Otherwise, is there, we're still under discussion. I call a question. Okay. Motion's been made to call the question. Is there a second to call the question? Second. Okay. Um, at this time, when we vote to call the question, which uh, what we're right voting on right now is to end input <coughs> and debate on this question. So everyone's clear. We're not voting on to pass the resolution with the recommendation yet. We're just Let's voting to end question. discussion. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Okay. Um, all right, we'll do a roll call. Roll call. All right, Mayor Okay, to uh, call the question. This is to call the question. question to, to end debate. All right, Warren? Aye. Falk? Aye. Bowers? Aye. Decker? No. Hammond, excuse, excuse Hannah. Me. No. Heidemann. No. Pat. No. Kittleson says no. Montemayor. No. Radke. Aye. Rindfleisch. No. Vanderweel. Aye. Versi. Abstain. And Wangerman. Aye. Seven no's, six yeses, one abstention. We can continue. Motion to call the question has failed okay. at this point in time. Uh, the chair would ask that the fire department has had heard the commentary this evening. Again, the question is whether or not we're going to put this on the ballot. If the fire department has some input they'd like to add this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, do not want to sit here another two and a half hours as the rest of you do. Um, there's been a lot of good points made. Uh, I've been given numbers uh, at the same time that you were tonight. Obviously did not have time to uh, research them. Um, I do have a couple of questions on, on the green sheet um, from Ms. Rayner. Uh, it's got a number of $29,700 for donated equipment lease value. Um, I'm not familiar with what that is. Um, there is a $50,000 estimate of supervision cost, and I think Alderman Hanna did bring this up. Um, I guess I'm wondering, is it your understanding that that is transferred then out of the fire department budget and into the ambulance? Um, I guess I'd like to know if that, that is a question or the answer to that. Um, also, nowhere in it, I think it was touched upon, but um, the amount in the fire department budget that comes out of my budget and is transferred into the general fund, and I think that was related to as just paper, um, but it is a deficit to the fire department budget. So, um, And I, I do uh, agree with Mr. Maples on the the actual hole in the 2009 budget, I think that his figures are, are um, fairly accurate. Um, the marginal cost issues, I think we can debate this and we have debated this for months and years on how the costs are allocated for the ambulance. Um, unless somebody can show me that there's costs that are not in the fire department budget and not in the ambulance budget that are an expense to the ambulance system, um, I, I guess I don't understand the argument because if it's in the fire depart department budget, it will come out of there and go into the ambulance and it's, it's the net result for the city is the same. Um, you know, I ran some figures on if we cost, expensed out all 18 paramedics um, and the expenses to the ambulance system, it's roughly, I think about 1.4, 1.5 million dollars. Um, if you subtract the eight or nine hundred thousand dollars, I'm projecting it a little bit higher next year of revenue, 
it is a deficit of about $800,000. Uh -huh. uh, but again, that comes out of the fire department budget. My question is, if you decide that we're not in the ambulance business anymore and we take those 18 paramedics away from the fire department, what do you have left? And, and I think that is the decision that this body needs to make uh, because that, it, it's in your power to decide policy and fire department level, police department level, department of public works level. Uh, so I think that the public needs to know that. I think you need to understand that, that with, uh, when you take bodies away from the fire department, stations will close, services will drop. Uh, there's, there's no other way around it. Uh, I think we saw the public outcry when we closed station five, um, just for a couple of months. I spent the better part of the last two months traveling around the state, researching on the internet, calling fire chiefs, calling city managers, looking at other systems uh, to compare us to. Just the, uh, on Monday, Alderman Bowers mentioned that the city of Oshkosh is looking at getting out of the ambulance business. No, no, I didn't say that. That's exactly what you said no. in the meeting. Well, okay. Uh, you know, I would recommend that we go up there and talk to them or uh, take a trip with, with a couple of officials and talk to them to see what their reasons are for looking at getting out of the, the ambulance business. Um, once again, it, this is a decision that the council needs to make as to what level of fire protection that you want. Uh, the ambulance, in my opinion, is funding part of your fire protection right now. If you take away just those four firefighters uh, that are funded in the ambulance budget, a station closes. So there is a, mm -hmm. a reduction in fire uh, and uh, public safety uh, protection just by reducing those, those four people. Um, I believe Ms. Aholm uh, made a comment in her statement that the only reason we took this on was to add employees. And I guess I would ask, how many employees did we have in the fire department prior to taking on the ambulance service? 78. And how many do we have today? Is it 78? What do we have then? Uh, we had 73, 73 when we took it on. Yeah. Right now we have 69. Right. Um, soon to be 73 in a week, although I would, uh, wouldn't be surprised if I get a call from four gentlemen who decide not to quit their jobs in the next week and come here. So once again, I, it's decisions that this council needs to make. You need to educate the public, whether it's through listening sessions, but um, make no doubt that uh, changes that are made from the system that we have now will have an effect on the delivery of public safety uh, to the community. And I think the one thing that was not mentioned tonight that's very important is Aurora uh, Memorial Hospital and St. Nick's have both stated that the system, the medical delivery system is better with the Sheboygan Fire Department in it. Um, the, the head of the state EMS has said the same thing. Um, and I think that's, some, that's something very important, that those three entities have said that the delivery of emergency medical services in the city of Sheboygan is better with the Sheboygan Fire Department as a part of it. If there aren't Alderman any Bowers. questions. Alderman Bowers, you're up. Yeah, I think it's five minutes are up, and I'd also category deny that I said, I talked with people in Oshkosh. They had no recommendations one way or the other, and I talked to the president of the council. Now, you say that I talked to them and they were looking at privatization? No, they're not. I, uh, Alderman Bowers, I didn't say that. On Monday, I asked you if there were any other cities looking at getting out of the ambulance business, and you informed me that you had knowledge that Oshkosh was. I talked to them, but they're not, I didn't say they were okay, getting out. Okay, fine. Okay. All right. Good. Cause that you, saves did me I set you straight or not? I said thank you, because that saves me thank another you. trip. Yeah, well, there are other people that are listening. Okay. As for five minutes, he's a department head. Um, so, and not a member of the public. Uh, that motion was not made to limit to five minutes, so I did let him speak. Alderman Wongaman, you're up. Uh, Chief, just one question, please. Are you against a referendum? Are you against letting, asking the people what they think of this? Because this is the question at hand. We're getting way off the question again. The question at hand is, shall we have a referendum? And my question to you, sir, is are you against a referendum? Um, I would say as somebody who has stood up here since 2002 talking about this very issue, um, thinking about that, that I'm not opposed to a referendum, but I would caution you that I hope this is not an easy way out.
for this body right here because I believe that this is what you were elected to do. If you are choosing this avenue as an easy way out for you, when, regardless of which way it goes, if, if, the, if the vote comes out to say, no, we want the ambulance and the fire department, and um, the people that know me well know that I'm a um, pretty fiscally conservative, um, you don't have to worry about that with me as chief, but I would hope that it's not viewed as, okay, the public voted this, the ambulance is in the fire department, it's a blank check. Uh, but that's one of the uh, possible outcomes of that. And the other is, if the public is up in arms that as a result of, that, of not being in the ambulance business, we close one fire station, we close two fire stations, we close three, whatever it turns out to be, I would hope that this body then does not say, well, we washed our hands of it, the public voted, that's what they got. So I guess I have a fear that it's an easy way out for this body. But am I afraid of a referendum? Absolutely not. Um, I've always Excellent. said, let's listen to the people speak. All the Hannah? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to re reiterate that um, as many people possible as part of the education process is critical. Um, the information's got to get out. Um, you know, I encourage groups on both sides of the equation to get out and. <laughs> Uh, and I know you'll be active in doing that and appreciate that. Alvin Borg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, in defense of what the citizens said, I have a copy here of the uh, letter that you wrote in the summer of 2007 in that magazine. And I want to quote a paragraph there. We are currently two firefighters short and have lost four in the last two years and had the real possibility of losing four to nine more in the next two years due to budget for shortfalls. That would have caused us to likely close the station. Under this proposal, meaning getting into the ambulance business, we will add four firefighters next year and have a staffing guarantee for the next five years. This is key. There is still a real possibility that Orange Cross will fold and we will take over the entire area. We would then look to add an additional 12 firefighters. Uh, now, if that doesn't say that this wasn't driven by increasing your staff, when you said it yourself in this article in the Union Magazine, I don't know what is. If you want to comment on that's fine, but that's what you said. And first of all, it was written for a Union Magazine. It was edited after it left my hands. Um, we have not added any more staff other than the four. Um, in fact, the council guarantee of staffing for five years uh, was not held up. So, um, yeah, I wrote that letter. And it said, it, I, don't have, I don't have to go over it again, it said you're hoping that Orange Cross folds and that that's going to mean an additional 12 firefighters. I don't know if I wrote in there that I was hoping they would fold, they would fold but in the event that we had to take over a larger service area, that's a possibility that we would have had to add staff. That's correct. Would I have that same viewpoint after being in the system for two and a half years? Probably not. Alvin Mercy. Sorry, I can't hold my tongue on this one. Got to correct a statement you made that you spoke with the state EMS director, which is Dr. Martins, and she stated that uh, it has been better since the fire department has taken over. Uh, I know that I'm is a fact that she has not made that Mr. statement. Mr. Brian Litza. Uh, no, Dr. Martins is a state EMS director, and she's also. I may have most misspoke on the title. Okay. I'm sorry. Alvin Belk. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, uh, echo Alderman Hanna's concerns about uh, this is a very complicated issue and putting it out to the people, it may devolve into this popularity contest worthy of a high school prom, you know, election and uh, because it's very complicated. People who are very good with numbers can disagree with people who are very good with numbers. Absolutely. Uh, and so, again, I have concerns about putting this out to the populace. Uh, not because I don't want them to have their say, but because it's a very complex issue and uh, I, I'm afraid it's going to turn into who spends the most money and who, turn, who makes who the worst guy and or the worst people and, and then that other side will win in a popularity contest. So again, could be unintended consequences. Other person, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Chairman. Previously, when, when uh, we had the ambulance in with the police department, there was a referendum in... November of 88 and two to one margin in favor of city ambulance service and even though they knew at the time it was going to cost them huge amounts of money to train the police 
because they were definitely not paramedics or just barely EMTs, um, the citizens then still said yes. So I think there is a, sometimes the public just wants it the way it was. And I don't want to make it that simple, but to get the public um, educated to the real possibilities that might happen is going to be very difficult. It is not a simple issue. It is very complicated. And remember when we did have Orange Cross and we worked at the county, we paid for that. It wasn't free. We paid for that. Finally, toward the end, we did not have to pay. But when it first started, we paid for that. And before Orange Cross was hired, there were a couple of other ambulances that we paid to come to the city. One of them just left. Another one intended to be here, but on the last day that they needed a certification from a local doctor, the doctor reneged and said, I will not do that. And that's how we came to have Orange Cross. And we did have to pay a lot. Now, I would guess we probably will again because Orange Cross will know we need them. We have no out if this is binding. I have another question for Colleen. Um, uh, the way the question is written, um, it says in favor of a private ambulance service. Do we need to add nonprofit so it's that we're not precluding companies like Orange Cross, that we are including them in the bidding process, or does private mean non government? Private sector. Yeah, that question for you. The, the term private, would that preclude uh, nonprofit uh, ambulance services? Do we need to add that so that the nonprofits can bid as well? well I suppose people could read it different ways. If you wanted to uh, include. Uh, I'm sorry, Terry McLean, we're televised, so we need to use the mics. Again, uh, people could interpret it different ways, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> Private, uh, if you want to say non-governmental, I suppose you could do that. Uh, but every time you put a word in there, it's going to have some sort of uh, effect that you may not totally want. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can take a, a second to address something Alderman uh, Montemayor said. My recollection on Orange Cross was, uh, I think, uh, when I first got here in uh, 85 and 86, the county subsidized Orange Cross. Uh, but when the city uh, dropped the police ambulance uh, and we contracted out, we went for bids. Uh, Curtis Ambulance was the winning bidder at the time, and I believe they, they may have been paying us something uh, but they didn't, they didn't fly either. They, they couldn't cut it. Uh, and I believe the, the latest two Orange Cross contracts, uh, the <coughs> most recent one was a joint contract be, with us and the county with Orange Cross, and I don't believe there was any subsidization. Right, not at the end. Uh, and, uh, you know, we didn't subsidize them, and they didn't, they didn't make any payments to the city either. Again, getting back to the text of your referendum question, if it's going to be mandatory, uh, you're going to have to be very careful on each particular word. If you want to make it advisory, and I'm not saying yes or no, that's up to you, but you'd have a little more leeway, and uh, uh, if you made it advisory and you didn't abide by the voters' wishes, uh, they'd vote you out at the next election. Uh, but then at least you'd know the will of the people, perhaps, and could take that into consideration in some of your financial factoring. But uh, again, I'm not here to argue one way or the other, but just to make you aware of potential consequences. Thank you. Alderman Bowers? Yes, to change the wording and make it nonprofit, you're eliminating a lot of ambulance services. I'm not saying change it all the way. I'm saying, are we precluding nonprofits from bidding right, right now? Well, we to add them as well because we're private, private or not right now we, we have what nonprofit no what do we have private 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 that would include everybody wouldn't it well that's my question does private I don't not know mean nonprofit as well I want to make sure that the nonprofits have a chance as, right. as well I'm saying. as long as we get everybody because I have you want broad-based yeah 
Because I have talked not with the people in charge, but people with different ambulance services, and they said it's an interesting situation. Now, these people had nothing to uh, uh, say about the bids themselves, but they said it's interesting, and they're out of town ambulance services. Now, the next question is, if we go to advisory, why don't we just, instead of postponing it, let's, let's say it's a binding referendum and get on with it and let the people decide. Thank you. Alderman Hanna? Yeah, at, at this point in terms of there's some, we'll have another kick at the cat at the full council. Hmm? We've got some words that we all need to do some homework on. Um, so I would call the question at this Second. Point. Motion to be made to call the question at this point in time. The question uh, upon calling would be as amended, because that question is, is in force. All in favor of calling the question say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Motion court carries. Question has been called. Uh, so the motion has been made and second to pass the resolution as amended uh, with a favorable recommendation to the full council. Uh, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Aye. Abstain. Aye. Yeah, okay. Warren. Aye. Falk. Aye. Bowers. Aye. Decker. Aye. Hanna. Aye. Heideman. Aye. Kath. Aye. Kittleson says no. Montemayor says no. Radke. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verse, Versi? Abstain. Thank you. Wangaman? Aye. 11 ayes, two noes, and one abstention. abstention. Motion carries. Motion carries. Uh, look for a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Thank you, Dennis. Second. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Abstain.